just lick it off of this. Um, I was going to start uh, just with picking up some points on the license appeal uh, in particular that uh, I was asked by my Lord of Justice first. Um, my Lord of Justice first just asked about interactions with copyright and trademark and also with the IP enforcement directive. Uh, and uh, I mean, the bottom line is in our submission, uh, nothing about our case adversely affects or is inconsistent with the position of those other areas of IP law. Uh, uh, what I have done is I, I was going to hand up uh, at the end of lunch, just the sections, uh, relevant sections that I'll just mention now, and also a brief part of Cope and Coffee. I mentioned this to my other friend, uh, just uh, just so that my Lord of Justice first and my Lords generally can see. Um, very briefly, uh, the position is that it is possible to have more than one exclusive licensee C for both copyright and trademarks. As regards copyright, my lords will find a discussion on that by Mr. Justice Pumphrey, as he then was in paragraph 26 of the Spring Form, where he made clear that multiple exclusive licensees are permitted in copyright, and indeed he says common. Section 92 of the CDPA defines an exclusive license as being a grant to exercise a right which would otherwise be exercisable exclusively by the copyright owner. As regards enforcement, the position is a bit different, and I think this is a point my learned friend has made in uh, their skeleton argument. Uh, under Section 101 of the CDPA, the Copyright Designs and Patents Act, an exclusive licensee was given the same rights and remedies, uh, except against the copyright owner, in respect of matters occurring after the grant of the license, as if the license had been an assignment, and his rights and remedies are concurrent with those of the copyright owner, and that's also a point discussed by Justice Pumphrey at Springfield. Uh, uh, the point that my learned friends have raised is that uh, the position has been uh, altered or expanded by Section 101A of the CDPA. Uh, that was a change made in 2003, uh, and it provides that certain non-exclusive licensees in copyright have right to bring proceedings. That was added uh, by the Copyright and Related Rights Regulations 2003, implementing the Information Society Directive. Uh, from both the direct, uh, from Copinger, uh, it said that this was, uh, there's a passage, and I'll, I can give it to you at lunch, uh, to enable uh, broadcasters in particular to act in circumstances uh, where they are neither the owner nor the exclusive licensee of rights in the content they transmit, uh, uh, but the owner content wishes them to be able to act, and I'll give you those uh, excerpts of Coppinger. Uh, the act itself is not limited to broadcasters or, or service providers or anything like that, and that was, uh, I understand, from the, uh, in our submission from the Patent Office, and also to ensure that it accorded with Section 8.2 of the Information Society Directive, which is not limited in that way. So the end result is that a non-exclusive licensee uh, 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 under 101A uh, can, if uh, permitted under its license, uh, bring proceedings. And that is a difference from the Patents Act. And indeed from trademarks. And indeed from trademarks. Uh, well, the position of trademarks I'll come to, uh, and that derives, uh, the Act uh, uh, derives from the directive and provides that licenses may be exclusive or non exclusive and may relate to some or all of the goods or services for which the mark is registered or for or all or part of the directive is uh, the member state to which the registration relates, and that has been set out in Section 28 of the 1994 Act, uh, and it says the licence may be general or limited. Uh, the definition of exclusive licensee in the Trademarks Act in Section 29 is to the exclusion of all other persons, including the person granting the licence, to use the trademark in the manner authorised by the licence. That's how that was done in the act, that Act. And sections 30 to 31 deal with enforcement, uh, and for trademarks, a non-exclusive licensee may call on the proprietor to bring proceedings, and if the proprietor refuses or fails to do so in two months, uh, they may bring proceedings. There is a, a separate section for exclusive licensees under section 31, that gives them the right to take proceedings in their own name, but it's not automatic in statute, it must be expressly provided for in the license. So uh, again, uh, a different Position. Finally, my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Burst asked about the enforcement directive as it applies in retained law. 
And in our submission, again, nothing we have submitted is contrary uh, or inconsistent with that. Uh, Article 4, it may be what my Lord or Justice Burse uh, was remembering, provides that a person's entitled to seek application of the measures, procedures, and remedies referred to in the directive include all persons authorised to use those rights in particular licensees insofar as permitted by and in accordance with the provisions of the applicable law. So in our submission, nothing we submitted yesterday would be contrary or inconsistent with the enforcement directive as uh, it uh, applies in retained law. But also I hope that deals with the questions that my Lord Justice first asked me yesterday and I will of course give a pack of the additional statutory provisions I've just referred to and I've mentioned that to my learned friend so that my Lords have them and I apologise they're not in the bundle already. My Lord, I then said I would deal with some issues on the costs side of the case uh, and there was of course a discussion yesterday about the status of the uh, EPO decision on the assessment and you have my submissions on that. Um, we then went on and uh, discussed, I went on and submitted uh, that if the EPO decision is to be taken into account, it is wrong to make the decision on costs uh, a binary one based on that decision alone or to ignore what happened in the UK action. And my Lord's had my submission that that does not accord with CPR 44.2. We say what happened in the proceedings ought to be factored in either under 44.22b, which is making a different order to the uh, unsuccessful party paying the costs or it may be factored in, having regard to all the circumstances under 44.24, which, as my Lords will know, include whether it was reasonable uh, for a party to raise or pursue allegations, the manner in which they were pursued, and whether the winner succeeded on the claim in whole or in part. Now, the questions yesterday arose, particularly on that last point, about uh, an assessment of issue-based assessment, uh, and we say that uh, had there been no EPO proceedings, uh, but Milan had won on the single point of insufficiency on what had succeeded in the EPO, it is, in our submission, most unlikely it would have got all its costs. Uh, and we say uh, it should not be in a better position, having lost in the UK. And my Lords will know uh, that in patent actions, it is common, if not actually probably the norm, for it to be an issue-based assessment primarily because of the nature of patent actions lends themselves uh, particularly well to such a course. And there are clear examples of significant deductions that happen. Uh, and a recent one, uh, and I accept that going to different cases is, is not necessarily uh, helpful, uh, but this illustrates merely that uh, significant deductions can and do take place. Uh, in conversant and Huawei, uh, Huawei were the overall winners the circumstances were such that they run numerous points and only succeeded on an added matter objection. And the court ordered that Huawei, the successful party, paid 70% of the losing party's costs. And that's just an illustration of the issue-based uh, uh, approach uh, in uh, uh, patent actions, always trying to, uh, the costs are accurately and fairly to represent what and my Lord or Justice Arnold asked me about the transcript uh, below before the judge. And I showed uh, you the court yesterday uh, that the question of the issue-based order was raised in the skeleton argument of the appellants in the manner I showed you yesterday. It was raised by the appellants in the transcript for the form of order hearing. Uh, and my Lords will find that. Uh, I don't need to go to it. I'll make submissions on it. But it's uh, sub Supplementary tab 9, and it's internal pages 83, 84, 109, and 122. 83, 84, 109, and 122. Uh, and uh, uh, it was raised by the appellants, as I said yesterday, I believe it was tab 8, sorry. Um, it was raised by the appellants, as I said yesterday, in the context of the appellants' position that they had won on all issues of validity but not on the exclusive license point. But it was also raised by my sorry, oh, sorry, I must be in the wrong place. Which tab is uh, it? I believe it might be. I've just been told that it was tab 8. I think I said tab 9. So I'm looking at your, your first reference, which is 83. And I 
wasn't seeping out of the <coughs> It's the very bottom. At the very bottom. Yeah, top of and, and the top of 84. This is council saying, my lord is entitled to say dot, 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 and then if there is to be an issue-based assessment, even after the EPO has wrote the patent, and that doesn't change the landscape. Is that right, Mr. That's right. So that's that's almost word for word the same submission as in the skeleton argument. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and the next one and is the next one was uh, page one hundred and nine. Page one hundred and nine. And that you it starts at line ten. So again, it's the same submission. And the uh, final one is in page 122. And that, uh, uh, this is uh, the judge actually, uh, and then confirming by uh, counsel. And that starts at line five. Yeah, so in summary, would you accept this as, as, as being the position? The question of an issue-based order was raised by your clients, both in writing and oral. But the submission made was that an issue-based assessment would still lead to the same conclusion, viz, you got all your costs except for exclusive licence. That, that was the uh, point raised by my clients, my lord is right. Um, in relation to, that wasn't the full picture before the judge, however, because um, my land also raised the issue of uh, issue-based assessment. And, and just for, uh, for completeness, I need to show my lords that. Uh, and uh, Mylan's position was, uh, as my lords will accept, uh, appreciate, their primary position was that they get all their costs, but they too raised the issue-based assessment, and they said that on an issue-based assessment they should still get their costs of anticipation and insufficiency, and their reason for that was they said, well, anticipation they succeeded at the opposition division, although of course that was not considered by the Technical Board of Appeal. And then on insufficiency, they were relying on the Technical Board of Appeal, appeal uh, finding. And they said that, they accepted that on an issue-based uh, approach, uh, they said inventive step should be discounted, should not get the cost for an inventive step. And they submitted in the transcript that they would not have appealed inventive step. And that is on page uh, 70 of this uh, transcript in the, in the micro pages. <coughs> Starting at line uh, 5 to uh, line 24, you will see there. And it wasn't. You'll see in the middle there, there's an issue by issue. Uh, they accept an obvious attack which we raised and lost because, in relation to that, it's not something we really pursued in the Court of Appeal. It's not something the TBA took into and it's, uh, <coughs> Mr. Jobless, can I just make sure I've understood what happened in the courts of appeal? <clears throat> because I know, I know you told us. I, don't, I really don't think this is going to matter, but it seems to have come up in that submission. The, the board of appeal gave a, gave an opinion that the patent was insufficient, and then the, the appeal was withdrawn, and that's a thing, as you said, that's a procedure which happens in the EPA. You were entitled to do that. <coughs> Had they previously, in, in that oral proceeding, given an opinion on novelty or inventive step? Or did they do sufficiency first? Um, Mine's are not at the, I don't think it was at the hearing itself. No, I mean at the hearing. I, 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 mean I think the hearing. preliminary opinion was in my client's favour on those issues. Right. And the that, that there's a debate because my clients obviously said they were slightly wrong-footed at the uh, appeal hearing. I don't want to go into that. No. Um, but Mr. Uh, Justice Mead didn't accept. I, 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 but uh, I was saying what my client's position was, and my client accepted. Uh, yes, but you've got a judicial finding against you on that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yes, it, so it didn't, there wasn't a, a finding, or they didn't give a, a different opinion on that on the day. Would have, they would have, so the way they were going to do the hearing was do sufficiency first and then do yes. novelty and inventive step afterwards. But that's, that was, that's my understanding, lot. which is again okay. quite that a, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. a typical way. You know, as my lord will know, they often start yeah. with added matter and then go sufficiency and then go okay. Thank anticipation. You. 
Um, and so, uh, page 70, I, I've shown you there. Um, and it wasn't just, uh, it didn't just, it wasn't just made uh, orally, uh, it was also uh, put in, in evidence. And, and just to show you that to complete it, that is Dr. Royal's statement in Supplementary Bundle Tap 13, where you should have the sixth uh, statement of Dr. Royal. Uh, and it's page uh, 293, where my lords can see uh, that there they uh, were talking about an issue-based uh, assessment if it's appropriate, uh, and uh, again, what is said, what's put out there is really what was, uh, in, in essence, what I've shown you in the submissions, uh, and their breakdown of uh, how they got uh, to 18% was in MJCR 25, and that's their breakdown of, of, of how costs were spent in the English proceedings. Um, and, and I noticed last night that actually MJCR 25 is not in the bundle. My learned friend saw the same, so he was going to hand it up, and so was I. So if I may, my lords, I'll hand it up so my lords have it. Um, Sisters, please send an email. With it. Of course. <coughs> Thank you. No hurry. Uh, and right. uh, so, so here we have the conventional page counting breakdown for, for the various issues. That, do we have? Well, was firstly, was there a corresponding one from your side? And secondly, if so, do we have it? Uh, no, and um, therefore no. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, my lords, th this is as. as as you mentioned yesterday, my, uh, as my Lord Lord Justice Arnold mentioned yesterday, uh, is the sort of breakdown one to see. And, and well, I, well, I go to this, my Lords, just it gives an, also an indication of, even on my learned friend's case, uh, the sort of proportions that were spent. Um, and as you see, what they've said is uh, insufficiency, and that's all their insufficiency arguments. Um, they said that uh, it was around 8.8% .8 of the skeleton arguments and closings, so that's the written documents, you see that in the top box, uh, third column at the end. And then in relation to the evidence uh, and, and the expert reports, you see uh, insufficiency, all arguments uh, from their expert reports, Professor Morgan was I think around about 1.25% of it in total, uh, and our expert reports are a little bit higher, 2.75, and they estimated at 2% on all insufficiency uh, arguments. And, and, and we do say that again highlights uh, what we say has gone wrong here, but even on my land's uh, estimate, uh, it's about 2% was spent on all insufficiency arguments, uh, and it's led to them getting 100% of their costs. Well, that's only 2% of the expert evidence. Well, that's right. Then it's, it's nearly 9% on the skeleton argument. Yeah, that's right. Uh, my submission would be that actually the real bulk of the cost is spent in working on the expert reports rather than the submissions in the written closing. So, uh, and as my laws will know, uh, the, the skeleton argument, the skeleton arguments, yes, they come in at a later date, they have council's costs, but the real bulk of the money spent in the patent actions is normally on the preparation of the evidence, or the expert evidence, in our submission. Um, in their assessment of inventive step analysis, which I'd showed you, and I think they had come up with uh, an 18 percent deduction, which is <coughs> uh, mentioned yesterday. I think I garbled it, but I mentioned it yesterday. Um, uh, that doesn't take account of uh, the common general knowledge, uh, which you see is at 34 percent. Again, this case is rather, as I showed you, a, 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 a stark one in the common general knowledge in that they lost on that uh, almost completely. I got criticised for their evidence. But that's the breakdown that they put in. Uh, and uh, we say uh, that that does uh, show, uh, put in context, uh, what we're arguing about here uh, and uh, what we say has gone wrong with the overall approach to the judge. 
Finally, uh, my Lord Law Justice Burse raised the question of an issue-based approach at delineating the issue rather than the percentage. Uh, and um, uh, if that was to be done, uh, 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 then the uh, appropriate order could be taken uh, from uh, Mylan's grounds of invalidity, which were set out in the judgment, uh, I showed you briefly yesterday, but if my lords would go back to uh, 4, tab 11, page 110. also have actually the grounds of invalidity in tab 17. Uh, the relevant ground uh, is ground 3A. 3B uh, fell away uh, because, uh, as my lords may remember, the patent was uh, uh, limited uh, by amendment to uh, 55 years old or, or, or above. So in effect you conceded that one. Yeah. My lord, my, my lord, but that's you did. That, that's the, yes. the point. And and that's, I can't. You accepted implicitly that was a good point. That you accepted that you were made to avoid it. My lord, I, I accept that. Yeah. So uh, that, but the, therefore three, uh, well, obviously four and five are different. Uh, and you've seen the percentages that my own friends put in uh, for all of the insufficiency points. But if uh, if the court was attracted to uh, the order such as. Uh, being not percentage but uh, by issue, uh, then uh, we would say that the appellants obtain their costs, say for the costs associated with paragraph three of the grounds of invalidity uh, and the issues relating to the exclusive license at the last point of course well, subject. I think that the point that remains for clarification, given what you've now been able to show us, which is helpful, thank you, is suppose we go down this route at all. In your submission, firstly, which is the correct way to do it? it should it be a pure issue-based order or should it be a bit more conventional percentage type of order? And if the latter, do you say we now have the materials to do it? My Lord, uh, on percentage, because my, my clients have not put in percentage. Uh, their well, percentage. exactly, so that's and why I'm asking the question. Yes, and, and therefore we would accept that the percentage, the percentage is put forward by, by my land, they're the only percentage before the court. And they so are. you would accept that if we thought that a percentage of a order was correct in principle, we can do it and, and should do it using the Milan thing? And we accept that. Thank you. If my lords are not attracted to the percentage route, then we would uh, commend the uh, issue route uh, in order to obtain what we say is an order that reflects not only the EPO, but also reflects what happened in the UK. Um, and I've uh, pointed you there to the issue. Uh, obviously, the exclusive licence point is subject to uh, the appeal. My Lords, um, I, I think I said I'd be about 15 or 20 minutes, um, and I, I hope that has been of some use this morning, and uh, unless I can help my Lords further, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Van My Lord, um, if I could just give a sort of summary overview of where we're going on, on all of the issues. Um, as to the appellant's appeal in relation to the exclusive license point, we do say there's an agreement which deprives uh, a purported exclusive licensee of the independent right to enforce, effectively denudes the grant of that exclusive license of any material value. Ultimately, the key right which is granted to an exclusive licensee is the ability to stop others or third parties working um, that invention as far as exclusive licensee has the right to the invention and claim compensation from those third parties if they were to infringe the patent. If you denude it by contractual agreement with the patentee, the exclusive licensee has effectively got a, 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 a right writ in water. Uh, uh, if we're wrong about that in relation to our respondents' notice on the salami slicing the invention, um, the uh, appellant's construction is that uh, 
the exclusive licensee is not the sole and exclusive person who has the right to exploit the entirety of the invention as claimed. Rather, Newham has reserved to itself the right to exploit part of the invention as claimed. And the key issue here for my lords, therefore, is whether or not um, an exclusive right in respect of the invention is what Newham has granted to Flynn, or whether it's only been granted in respect of part of the invention, the invention having been sliced up. And we say it has clearly been sliced up, and as a matter of reality, Flynn has not been granted any sole or exclusive right in relation to the invention as claimed, and that's going to have serious consequences as to how you then ever try to enforce exclusive licenses under 67.2, if my Lord's attempted by that uh, uh, way forward. As to costs, um, my learned friend's ground one asks um, uh, who is the winner. We say the judge uh, correctly found that and uh, there was no, my learned friends failed to identify an error of principle. The question is who is the winner in the UK proceedings, not who was the winner at the trial. Milan was clearly the winner of the UK proceedings at first instance, as it got all the relief that it could possibly hope to get from the UK proceedings, and the claimants got nothing from the UK proceedings, both legally and commercially. As to um, my own friend's amendment to ground one, even if Milan were the winner, should there have been a different order as to costs? Uh, we say again they have failed to identify an error of principle. The judge, in fact, took into account all relevant matters and decided against making a different order. That was within the judge's discretion, so to do. As to ground two, um, the 16th of December 2020 order should not have been varied uh, a, 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 as a matter of discretion. It's common ground for my learning friend's position that the uh, judge had jurisdiction to vary. And uh, we say uh, the 16th of December 2020 order uh, was required to be varied because it was unjust to allow it to stand when the patent rights no longer existed specifically considering it contained provisions relating to delivery up, destruction upon oath, and an undertaking not to sell, which absent varying would have stood in place. The change of circumstances materially affected the costs order as well. Prior to the revocation of the patent, Newham had been the winner in the UK, and after revocation, Milan became the winner, and the costs needed to be changed to reflect that. Third ground, the issue-based cost order, which my learned friend has just been addressing this morning. Again, it's within the judge's discretion, no error of principle. Firstly, in fact and in substance, the appellants did not seek an issue-based cost order before the judge at first instance. Rather, they sought all their costs. Secondly, they did not put in any evidence as to the costs on an issue-by-issue issue basis. Thirdly, therefore, there's no error of principle before the judge. And fourthly, on the facts before the judge, both sides asked for all their costs as their primary submission. It was only Milan who put in evidence as a secondary position as to what the position might be on an issue base basis. And on that basis, we said there should be an 18% discount to reflect the uh, loss of the inventive step or obviousness argument in circumstances where we're the overall winner that the Board of Appeal had uh, indicated that the patent was insufficient and as a matter of fact and law the patent was held invalid for anticipation upon Neurim's abandonment of their appeal to the TBA. So that's our um, overall um, landscape for my lords. Um, I, I want to um, make a... J just yes. while we're getting the overall landscape, um, we, we obviously will need for this by one o'clock. Yes, and I'm going to try to do as quickly as I can. Okay, I'm, I'm sure so. Um, so to allow Mr. Likidopoulos time to reply, can you make sure you finish by, say, 
25 to 1. I, I will. Um, I, could I also ask my lords to move me on if you think I'm getting bogged down? Because there are, you know, I've got my quite a long note, and, and they're saying this Mr. Likotopoulos didn't mention, but hasn't abandoned his written um, uh, skeleton argument, which I was going to address. And if my lords don't need me to, please move me on. Thank um, you but I, I do understand where we, we are, my lords. Um, so, general points. Um, uh, uh, very short housekeeping point, which I'm going to do very speedily. I want to go to the patent very, very briefly and the license agreements and then the um, uh, Swan report before dealing with the heart of the two exclusive license uh, points. First one is pure housekeeping. Strictly speaking, the service up and skeleton argument, I need my court, this court's uh, permission to rely on uh, reference to Swan report. My learned friend doesn't take any point in relation to it. Um, I, I take it. Okay. That's very speedy. I think we've already been taken through. I think we've taken through it anyway, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, it's it's set. anybody ever ask for permission to put report, departmental reports before the court? What you really need permission for is to hand some. Well, that's what we asked for, my lord. And, and, and the reason was because we had this one report already in. All substance but went to Mr. Exactly. 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 And that's what we asked for. I can't rule that. I'm not exactly. <laughs> just, just checking. Um, now, as to um, the points on the pattern, I want to very briefly take you, because my learned friend took you to the um, claims, uh, but this goes to the heart of how small a grant was ever, ever actually given to uh, Flynn. Uh, and so in supplemental bundle, if we could, my lords, turn to um, tab 21. And start to page 325, the patent. My learned friend took you to the claims. I'd like you to just go briefly, if you could, to uh, paragraph 13 and 14, which effectively set out um, the uh, two aspects of the claims in the um, Swiss form and the EPC 2000 form. And, and, and then um, paragraph 15, the detailed description of the invention. The medicament or of or useful in the invention is preferably characterized in at least one of the following features. It's adapted for oral, rectal, parenteral, transbuchal, intrapulmonary, or transdermal administration. And then as to um, 17, for oral administration, the medicament may be utilized as e.g. tablets, capsules, emulsions, solutions, syrups, or suspensions. And then we give further examples in relation to uh, parenteral um, uh, uh, administration. So, um, what that means is, and look, my learned friend then took you to the claim to the claim, and I should just very briefly go back to that. Claim one, page uh, 332, has no limitation in relation to the form of the resulting medicament um, and, um, or how it's to be administered. So it includes any medicament which is for all use, all administration, rectal, parenteral, etc. And this is further confirmed by claim two, which further characterizes the following features. And if you look at claim two, Roman uh, one, you see those extra administrative routes being identified. So what that means specifically in relation to oral use, my lords, is that um, the claim includes tablet form, capsule form, emulsions, solutions, syrups, and suspensions. And from a homely perspective, if this was an invention <coughs> for LEMSIP, effectively claim one encompasses both <coughs> LEMSIP administered by a capsule and LEMSIP administered by granules, which, to which water is added, and LEMSIP <coughs> administered in um, tablet form. And similarly, claim four is in a similar format. Now, my, my lords will appreciate this is central to whether Flynn was ever granted any exclusive rights in relation to the invention as claimed, because that applies to all the claims of this patent, or rather a salami slice. Well, and you're pushing it at an open door there, because Mr. Likodopoulos does not dispute that the exclusive license is not coextensive with the claim. His answer is it doesn't need to be. Yes, and what I'm going to show is it's so, so small. I mean, it's an obvious point we're going to come to, but clearly what this means is he can grant, it on his constructions, it's open to them to grant exclusive licenses for a tablet for oral use, a capsule for oral use, a solution for oral use, or, let's get even more absurd, a red, red capsule, a white capsule, a blue capsule, and so forth. 
in exactly the same field, exactly the same invention. As I understand it, Mr. Um, Van Hegen, your yes. clients ultimately stopped arguing that they didn't infringe. I don't know if they admitted infringement, but infringement certainly wasn't yes. an issue by the time it got to the trial. Yes, yes, that's correct. So, so no matter how small this is, it still covers your clients. Yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. But the, the, do we know the, roughly how big the market's worth? How much it's worth? This very small thing. No. Um, uh, don't I, tell I, me if it's a secret. It's all right. I, no, I, I, I'm just. I can't remember what the size is. It's, it's obviously not it's a lot of money. Significant, exactly. No. And, and, and let's not get um, unrealistic about this. They, they could have, and of course they did try to amend down. They started amending down because they originally had a claim which would range from point, I think, point zero two five milligrams there on the up, up to ten milligrams. And they saw the point, the force of this point, and said, "Oh, damn! Let's slice down to two milligrams because then that's, of course, what the occasion is and what what the infringement is." What they didn't do is carry on doing that because they were aware of this issue. Now, my lord, I understand the commercial aspect. And I was taking, putting this brief, but I'm, I'm putting to you just the legal consequence of this. Uh, and it, what it, jumping ahead, what it comes down to is you can have an infinite number of exclusive licenses on this construction, my loan for suggesting, without any reference to the technical aspect of the invention itself. And that's going to go to the heart of how you deal with practical consequences of section 62, 67, 2. Because what everyone's always thought about before, when one's looked at this, and Humphrey in particular in spring form, is you have a clear demarcation between exclusive licensees and their field of application and their geographical area and so forth. But here, you don't have that, and you won't have that. And jumping right ahead, you can ask yourself, well, how is this going to work? I've got an exclusive licensee with, let's say, a capsule, another exclusive licensee for, let's say, the syrup, and an infringing tablet comes on the marketplace. Exclusive licensee for the capsule brings infringement proceedings. Patentee is not interested. Patentee is joined as a co-defendant, wins infringement and then says, I want an account of your profits, infringer. Prima facie is entitled to his profits, be stripped. Then along comes, two years later, the other exclusive licensee and says, joint uh, patentee as a defendant, says, now I want my damages. You've suffered, you've caused <coughs> me to suffer real loss. You've got directly competing product within the invention and in the same field activity. Section 67 two doesn't in any way preclude that. In fact, it allows that to take place. And it does show the complete unreality of salami slicing. What's the answer? And the answer at the end of the day is actually because the starting point, the act, the act says, it's a right to the invention. The invention is defined. That is that which is set out in the claims. And that's the beginning and the end of the construction that's re-fortified by what the Swan Report had in mind and says. Um, so, ju just to make good the open door, my lord, I should just make uh, clear what the position is in relation to the licence agreements. The product in the licence agreement uh, in the original 2011 uh, definition was circadian as covered by the existing marketing authorisation my lords um, have seen the uh, existing marketing tool authorization, but I can again just show you, just to nail this point down, in um, supplemental bundle tab 17, uh, this is the uh, annex to the uh, marketing authorization for Cicadian, and you'll see. The name is a, a section one, prolonged release tablet. Two is the qualitative and quant quantitative composition. And you see that's each is a prolonged release tablet containing two milligrams of melatonin. Pharmaceutical form, and that's important because we're going to come to what that the importance of that when we come to see the expanded version of the definition, is a prolonged release tablet. Uh, you see the clinical particulars of 4.1, uh, 
and right at the bottom, 4.2, methods of administration, oral use. Tablets should be swallowed whole to maintain prolonged release properties. Crushing or chewing should not uh, be used to facilitate swallowing. So that needs to be contrasted with um, what then the license is expanded to in, uh, in May 2020, which you'll see in the supplemental bundle at tab four. page 58 and 3.4 you'll see it means the prolonged release prescription product containing 2 milligrams known as circadian including any generic equivalent or version thereof and um, as to um, the, the, the uh, license doesn't um, define generic equivalent but as you have seen from our scholars and arguments of Farrell 37 and 38 and as was before the judge um, one gets uh, uh, a, a view as to what that means from the uh, relevant directive, which is in the authorities bundle at tab 30. Page 385. And this is directive 2001-83 EC on the community code related to medicinal products for human use. And this, this is the chapter one related to marketing authorization. And uh, article one, by way of derogation and without prejudice to the law relating to protection of industrial and commercial property, the applicant shall not be required to provide results of preclinical clinical tests or clinical trials if he can demonstrate the medicinal product is a generic. And it's what, this is what the case is all about because um, um, Newham complained about us jumping on the back of their marketing authorization. Of, of a reference medicinal product which is or has been authorised under Article 6 for not less than eight years. And you'll see the definition of generic med medicinal product in 2B shall mean a medicinal product which has the same qualitative and quantitative composition in active substances and the same pharmaceutical form as the reference medicinal product and whose bioequivalence has been demonstrated. So same pharmaceutical form. So so that means it's limited to, under this license, it's limited to tablets. Doesn't include capsules, doesn't include syrups, doesn't include solutions, and so forth. That is the extent of the license, the maximum license which was granted by Neurim to Flynn. Now, the, the second and intermediate point about the um, licenses is that it's common ground that as a result of the um, amendment to the 2011 license in January 2020, that um, uh, under clause 3.1, there is one change to the original, la the non-exclusive language. So the, the original grant was a license which was not exclusive. The only material change affected by um, uh, the January 2020 agreement was the introduction, introduction of the word exclusive in clause 3.1. And that won't take their at the moment, but that's clause 3.6 of the 2020 agreement. And then the material clauses about enforcement, which came in under clause 3.7. And uh, what was found uh, by the judge was that there was no provision for Flynn being able to bring proceedings independently of Newham. And the judge found that at paragraphs 135, 143, 144, I think 145, and confirmed again in 146 of his judgment, that the contractual effect of the January 2020 agreement was that Flynn, under that amendment, had no right to bring a claim for infringement of the patent independent of Newham. Now that is not challenged. They don't. They don't challenge that. Rather, they say that any such contractual limitation is irrelevant uh, to whether Flynn <coughs> was an exclusive licensee under the um, Act. And whilst this may seem counterintuitive, effectively the arguments, um, counter arguments are very simple. <laughs> um, their argument is: I look at the, ex the exclusive license provisions in terms of the interpretation section in the Patents Act, 1977, Section 130. 
I fall within that, that's it. I don't need to look any further. Even though, even though under the contract, I have uh, prevented or been prevented from bringing in any enforcement rights, which the statute says such an exclusive licensee should have under section 67.1 and 67.2. And, uh, sorry, forgive me, Mr. Van Heer. Yes, I do. Sorry. Um, just while you're on the contract, can I make sure I've understood one aspect of it? Yes. Uh, you, you've explained the judge's conclusions, which, as you said, aren't challenged about the effect of or visions yes. on the ability of the exclusive licensee to bring patent infringement proceedings. That would be against infringers, third parties. Presumably, and I don't know, but I'm presuming that those provisions don't prevent the exclusive licensee from suing the patentee for breach of contract if the patentee started trying to breach the exclusivity of those provisions. Uh, it's si silent about that. So it's silent, it's silent about that. Is that yes. right? Exactly. Because that, that would be a claim for breach of contract. Exactly. A claim for patent. And, and uh, my Lord's almost ahead of me of what I'm going to say in terms of the, in, in terms of uh, the absurdity we say of the exclusive license right. provisions, because. Um, one just needs to consider then under under this contractual scenario or any hypothetical one which if my lords are attractive to my learned friends submissions it would allow uh, there to be an exclusive licensee in circumstances where the exclusive licensee and the patentee have agreed that, for example the exclusive licensee can bring no action for infringement just, just, now, just getting, but just, just yes. off, off actions for infringement for a second. Yes. So to set, to, I thought that this contract, even if it did, let's say, prevent the exclusive licensee from bringing no patent infringement claims yes. against anybody else. Yes. Nothing that you've shown me, at least, uh, indicates that the patent that the exclusive licensee has lost what one might think is the most important right that exclusive licensees have, which is the right to stop the patentee himself from selling. the Product because that's a contractual right, not an not a. Uh, I, I, I accept and in theory and in practice in this case that's absolutely correct. Okay. He doesn't have the right to bring an infringement proceeding. No, but he wouldn't bring an infringement. You never do but, bring but, infringement proceedings against no, the patentee but, because but, the patentee gives himself authorization. That's yeah. why it's a breach of contract claim, not an infringement. Claim. But, but 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 my lord, what, what my lord's put to me, that's the most important right. Well, actually, it's not well, that important. But it's certainly a, a fact to take into account. Mm -hmm. But another fact to take into account, and also of course the one that effectively. Mm -hmm. The Swan Report was also considering was once a patentee is granted an exclusive license, it's disinterested often in um, uh, what actually happens in the marketplace because it has in provisions for payment by the exclusive licensee of minimum royalties or whatever. And <coughs> it's, it's satisfied itself that it's got its financial compensation. Yeah. So what one doesn't address is actually what we say is the big mischief, mm -hmm. which is actually the patentee standing back and watching third parties. So, so just putting that point yes. in a different way so it's sort of understood it. Yes. What you're saying there is that the contractual claim as between right. licensee and patentee was one that would always have existed at common law. Absolutely. And therefore, no intervention by the Swan Report was required. Absolutely. What Swan did was to say that the exclusive licensee would get a claim for patent infringement in parallel with the patentee. Absolutely right. And because ultimately the exclusive licensee is the one who's going to be suffering the harm and has the compensation, needs, needs to have the control to be able to bring those proceedings for infringement and compensation if it thinks it's appropriate. And of course, the, the classic example, I'll just labour the point, I'm sure my Lord, my Lord Justice Burst has got it, but Patty stands by, third party enters the, mar the marketplace, infringes wildly and <laughs> excessively in relation to the product. Um, exclusive licensee has no right to enforce. At all. Yeah, so, so I think we, we get that point, but where that leads us to is, and you will show us in a moment, where the Swan Report says not merely that the licensee is to have a claim, but that it is to be a claim exercisable independently of the patentee, and where the word independently is to be found in the statute. Um, I, I will do my best, my Lord. <laughs> I, I see the challenge, and I, I'll go, we'll go to this one report and we'll see what, what I can get out of it. Um, but the right, uh, I will just say on the hoof in relation to section 67.1, well, let's have a look at section 67.1 now. We can do that in terms of the in, independent right, because the gist is exactly it is an independent right, because if the patentee uh, doesn't play ball, 
he just gets joined as a defendant. So let me look at that in section 671 straight away, if I may. That is in the authority bundle at tab 26. Thank you very much. And uh, page 362. What it says in 671 is the holder of an exclusive licensee under the patent shall have the same right as proprietor to bring proceedings in respect of any infringement committed after the date of license. Same right, so, in, so normally a patentee is obviously like, like to bring independently. In awarding damages or any other relief, um, take into consideration any loss suffered and so forth, that's not relevant to the proceedings. <coughs> section 673 is though, in any proceedings taken by an exclusive licensee by virtue of section, Proprietor shall be made a party to proceedings, but if but if made a defendant or defender shall not be allowed for any costs and expenses unless he enters an appearance and takes part in these proceedings. So, so subsection three appears to say the exact opposite. It's not an independent right. On the contrary, both a patentee and exclusive licensee must be party to the proceeding. And that's where I say no, because what it means by independent right, it means independent right to bring proceedings. The exclusive licensee has the independent right to decide to bring proceedings. The patentee can elect effectively to join with that. If he doesn't, has to be made a defendant. But, the, but what, is, what is given to the exclusive licensee is the right to bring proceedings. What's been suggested by my learned friend in, his, in their submissions is that under contract, that is taken away. There is no independence in the sense that the exclusive licensee, um, absent the patentee saying, I'm, I'm going to start proceedings, can bring proceedings. And therefore, while it may seem counterintuitive, you've got a section dealing with interpretation of exclusive license, that's in the context where the exclusive license provisions were brought in under the, in the 49 Act, following the recognitions in Swan, so as to allow that exclusive licensee to have this statutory right. I mean, is this right? Even with the contractual constraints, yes. Section 67 gives Flynn something of value. I say, I say, um, Section 67, with with the with the hypothetical contractual constraint means that Flynn doesn't fall within Section 67. No, I follow so, so But suppose it, it, it... The fact that there is a contractual constraint... Yes. Supposing that Section 67 in principle bites, yes. it's still of value to Flynn, well, even though it's subject to the contra contractual uh, uh, what constraint. I'm saying, what, what I'm saying is it's a completely circular argument. Normally, under a, uh, to try and tell where someone's an exclusive licensee, you've got to look at the documents which, are, uh, which grant that license to them. And that's standard contractual principles, Humphrey said it in uh, Dendron, I think. Um, but here, and this is, this is the key point effectively coming out of my learning friend's skeleton at the end about effectively trumping, if you've got a contract which says you, exclusive licensee, cannot bring infringement proceedings, which is what he says is entitled to have, then how does section 67.1 work? I've got, hypothetically, I've got an exclusive license falling within the scope of section 130. I've got a contract which is within that exclusive license says, you, the exclusive licensee, can't bring any infringement proceedings whatsoever. I say... But that's not this case. It's very close to this case, my lord, because, because this case is, you can't bring it independently. But that makes all the difference. No, well, 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 because the key point is whether you can recover damages. Let's put profits on one side for a moment. The point is... Can Flynn recover damages? No, the key because point that's is, that's what no, the purpose of this is: is to enable Flynn to recover damages for its own loss, and if not prevented by these contracts. There's one stage further back. The key point is: is Flynn falling within section 61, 67.1? It does it have? Is, is it the hold of an exclusive license within the meaning of section 67.1? The starting point, building block, is. You've got to look at the contractual arrangements in place between it and the patentee. Uh, if those uh, contractual arrangements, on this hypothesis, say you can't bring any infringement proceedings, so there's got no rights under contract to bring 
infringement proceedings, even though the contract says on, and on its face, you have an exclusive license within the meaning of section 130, you've then contracted out all your rights to bring any infringement proceedings. But, but that, this is not that case. Well, well let's let finish on, on our case, let's yeah. assume that there was an alleged infringement. Flynn notifies Neurim, and Neurim says, we're not going to sue. They can sue them for breach of contract. No, not necessarily. No, that's not the case. Why not? That, 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 isn't, that hasn't so, been. There, there, no. No. No, I don't, I don't accept that, my lord. It, All right. Um, That's interesting. Let's have a look. Uh, Stop time for three years. <laughs> so, um, page 44, 1722.2. Two. I'm sorry. 17.2.2 .2. Joint enforcement. The parties have agreed that they will jointly take the appropriate steps to enforce any new RIM patent. New RIM shall take steps including initiation, prosecution, and so forth. Right. So new RIM shall sounds pretty mandatory to me. Doesn't give new RIM a discretion. Uh, well, Shall take steps including initiation, patrol, and control of any suit or proceedings. So it can control those by not bringing proceedings. It doesn't require it to bring proceedings. <coughs> there. Um, and it's a difficult construction. It is a difficult construction. The point, and, and to be fair, it wasn't a point that was raised below, but it, the point I want to make is that it, it's actually irrelevant, my lord, ultimately to the point of issue before this court, which is a, uh, an issue which is that despite the contractual limitation on the exclusive licensee, they're still entitled to fall under section 67.1. And that we say, that's, that's the argument being put. And it's, it, it, it effectively is what some of It's not disputed. That if there is a requirement for an independent right of action, then this doesn't fulfil that requirement. The question yeah. is whether there is such a requirement. There's, 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 there's no challenge to the judge's finding. Exactly. That's what I've just said. Yeah. Yeah. That's not in dispute. So the yeah. question is purely, as a matter of statutory construction, is that required? And, and you've had my submissions in relation to that. Um, uh, I just wonder whether there's any more I can do. Yeah, I, I think it's one more point to make, but just um, before I leave, I just want to make sure I've, I've got clear everything I can express to my Lord um, in, in relation to this point, which is that. Um, so, well, Egan, I think yes. it's very clear. You, your point is, you say, that the, the way this act works is that exclusive licensees have to be able to bring independent proceedings and, and there's a clear finding by the judge not challenged that this, 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 this party can't do that therefore they're not an exclusive I mean that's your case it's very simple y yes uh, and it's, at the point I just wanted to I just remember what it was actually it's really picking up my, my learned friend's um, skeleton um, the consequence of this which is uh, at paragraph um, 49 of their skeleton um, Exclusive license bundle, tab one, page 13, paragraph 49. Uh, the submission is this. Having found that Flynn was exclusive license 131, the judge was obliged to hold, obliged to hold that the statutory consequences under section 67 followed. Had he correctly done so, he would have concluded that Flynn had the same right as the patentee to bring proceedings in respect to infringement of patent. So their case is despite not having that right under contract, the statute somehow trumps that. Because they are saying that whilst we aren't granted the right to bring those proceedings by the contractual arrangement, as soon as we are an exclusive licensee, nonetheless, section 67.1 applies to us. You, you can spin that the other way, though, can't of you? Course. You can say, well, the statute gives you the right 
and then you can choose if you wish to to contract to limit your right. You, you could exactly, but then that's why I'm saying, what's the purpose, and and what what is the right that the statute is giving us? No, but one right, yeah. as my lord was saying, that the statute gives you is the right under section sixty-seven two. Yes. To get damages related to your loss. Only if you've got standing under section sixty-seven. No, quite. Yes. But. Um, uh, there's a perfectly sensible justification for the statute applying, even subject to the contractual constraint, because that's what enables the licensee to get damages. But, but, if, but if, if the licensee's agreed with the patentee that he's not going to take any proceedings, he's therefore denuded from that ability to get any compensation unless the patentee brings proceedings. Quite. Now, and so... so or, or authorises oh. bringing of proceedings. Um, y yes, but, uh, yes, that's probably right. But, 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 the, but the, the main point is the, the, the exclusive licensee can't get his compensation independent of the patentee. And the whole thrust of Section 67, we say, is to give that right to the exclusive licensee who is not fettered by the patentee. I don't know. I mean, he wouldn't have had any right at all, even with the patentee's consent, without Section 67. Now he does. He had, prior to Section 67, or prior to the uh, Freedom Act of 1949, Act, he had no right whatsoever to bring proceedings. Yeah. But, and I apologize I'm, I'm leaving this point unnecessarily, but, but um, he, he, owed, he, he has that right if he's an exclusive licensee and if he falls within uh, Section 67. But in order to find out whether you are an exclusive licensee, you have to look at the contractual arrangement you've got in place between you and the patentee. If the contractual arrangement says in terms, you can't bring infringement proceedings, or even, my Lord, Lord Justice Arnold, you can't bring independent, uh, infringement proceedings independently in the sense that I've been saying, then you are entirely dependent on the patentee to bring proceedings. And that then effectively denued Section 67.1 for any value, because you're back to what was the pre-statutory position. Save that if the things are started, you can then claim damages in addition. Yeah, and, and, and the other point that made in our scope, and my lords, I'm sure my lords have got it, while we're at the, the uh, statutory provisions, could one be very kind to turn to uh, 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 page uh, 370, where uh, we have the start of the interpretation section, and um, I'll go to 371 first. That's where the exclusive licensee, exclusive license is set out. It means that which we've been discussing: the license from the proprietor conferring on the licensee, to the exclusion of all other persons, any right in respect to the invention to which the patent relates. But the, all of these provisions here are subject to Roman uh, numeral 1, 30, 130 sub 1, page 370, in this act, except so far as the context otherwise requires. So what we say is that the statutory provision actually is section 67, 1. That's the context. And then the definition is set out um, which um, allows Section 67.1 to have force once you understand the purpose is to allow the exclusive licensee, and use the word, independent of the patentee, to bring proceedings. Yeah, just to be unfair, yeah. when you come back to Section 67, yeah. using the term exclusive license, yeah. you say in the context that has to be construed in some way other than the definition in Section 130. No, I, I say that 130 is not an, not, a, not an exhaustive definition for the purposes of uh, Section 67.1. Section 67.1 requires, when you're interpreting these documents in front of you, firstly, to have that exclusive license within the meaning of Section 130, but also the contract must also either make provision for, or at least certainly not exclude, your rights under Section 67.1 to bring proceedings. Can I just try reasoning it through? Yes, so, of course. I apologise for that. No, no, no. no. So section 130 says the definition applies except so far as the context otherwise requires. 
as, yes. I, as I understand it, you're saying, well, in Section 67, yep. the context does require something other than the... Other than just the pure definition. You can't just simply say, there's a definition, I've got that, therefore Section 67 applies. So uh, exclusive licence has to have some different meaning in Section 67. No, it, no, it's the same, but it's the, the, the holder of an exclusive licence is one which has that licence but has the ability to bring proceedings as set out in section 67.1, as you say. I'm not sure I've quite got it. So section 67 says the holder of an exclusive license. Yes. Exclusive license is on the face of it defined in section 130. Yes. But as you point out, that definition only applies except so far as the context yes. doesn't require otherwise. Yes. I infer that you're saying the context requires otherwise. It, it, or does it, is that not your case? It, it, it does in the sense that um, th that is not a complete definition when you come to consider uh, uh, are you a holder of exclusive license within under section 67 because you've got to ask yourself there does that contract prevent you from being proceedings under section 67 well it, is it or is it not your case that exclusive license bears the meaning in section 130 in the context of section 67 I, I accept it does bear that meaning, but it's not enough in the context of section 67. <coughs> so you have to, it's the bare minimum. You have to have that. Well, you're trying, I think, is, is this a fair way of putting your point, Mr. Randall? Probably better than the way I'm putting it. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. Yeah, I'll wait for the question to pause, but. <laughs> what you're saying, I think, is that, that section 67.1 should be understood or should be interpreted as saying the holder of the exclusive license must have the same right as the that's what you're saying, essentially. That's right. That's what that's what is granting exactly. Well, yes. Yes. Exactly. But, it, but it's but it's. But yes, you're its right. Effect is that, in other words, to be an exclusive license within the meaning of this act, you must have this right. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's and you say you can get that out of the words of section sixty seven. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And that's why. Um, uh, everyone up until now has always said you've got to look at the agreement as a whole, and you can't just simply say. Uh, 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 that uh, you can look at one portion of the agreement that says here's an exclusive license therefore um, you fall within the meaning of it because it's just it's analogous to say I can look at um, a license a purported license agreement um, between a patentee and a, uh, and a licensee and the patentee in one hand says you've got an exclusive license and then at the end of the agreement says but um, you agree that I can also work the invention as well you've got to look at the totality of the agreement See, yes. what's so that's not this case, is it? I mean, I mean, there's no question that Sir Richard Office's client, or the internet, you know, Flynn at least, has a license <laughs> and it is exclusive. Uh, subject to my Islamist license, <laughs> exactly. Well, no, well, it is Absolutely. a license and it is exclusive. You it say, is, it, it, your it, point it, is that it's not an exclusive license within the meaning of the Patents Act because of the definition in section 67.1. To, to, to give Flynn the standing because yeah, because it's it's yeah. it's circumscribed by limitations yeah. in the agreement itself. Um, uh, now, I've jumped quite a lot. Maybe I'll just very briefly take you to the few comments on the uh, uh, um, uh, the Swan report, if I may, um, and that's in the authorities bundle again at tab thirty-two. Um, my learned friend rightly um, explained that it's common ground um, exclusive license provisions were first introduced into the 49 Act uh, and have been carried through to the 77 Act and the 49 Act was um, enacted at the recommendations of this one report and if we go to page um, Sorry, page uh, 419. Uh, and uh, my lord, if you look at um, cla um, clauses um, or sections, 100, paragraphs 129 and 130, uh, we say this is quite clear that the purpose of um, this uh, was to allow exclusive licensee to have a cause of action. To sue in his own name, 
and to obtain compensation for damage caused to it as a result of the infringement. Yeah. Um, and maybe, maybe that uh, is addressing my Lord's concern about what we mean by independent, sue in their own name, um, even if the patentee is not interested. Um, and uh, prior to this, obviously, exclusive license had no right to bring proceedings and no right, uh, no means of recovering compensation, even if the infringement was causing him harm. And that we see at N129. Um, and um, 132, Swan Report makes clear that uh, only limited exclusive license, it says it, that only exclusive licensees who have this right, not um, other non exclusive licenses. Um, and you'll see from 132, that is because um, the position of exclusive select licensee is that uh, uh, different, he's been promised immunity from such legitimate competition as would spring from the grant of additional licenses. I mean, just, just pausing at 132, it says a licensee whose license is non-exclusive has not the same cause to complain of encroachment yes. as has a licensee who has been promised exclusive rights. An ordinary licensee receives no guarantee against competition. Yes. But someone in Flynn's position has been given a guarantee against competition. Well, uh, that's, that's why I'm going to come on to in terms of um, salami slicing. Quite, quite. But, but in terms but, of this before, first point, before this. He's, he's not given any guarantee in the sense that he's been, give, he's been granted under the contract an exclusive right. But the guarantee doesn't then follow because the patentee uh, in Flint's shoes may not bring proceedings to stop that third party competition. Yeah. Whereas, obviously, if, if, the, if the exclusive license has these rights, it, it, it has that guarantee got that guarantee by the statute. Um, and then you see the recommendation in 133. So provision be made in the Acts to enable exclusive <coughs> to institute proceedings in his own name. That's the independent point I'm trying to uh, make very inelegantly. Um, and to claim relief by way of injunction and uh, deliver damage and delivery and so forth. And then 134, it's, it's confirming that um, Exclusive licensees to note not only a licensee who is solely and exclusively entitled to work in invention in its entirety in the UK, but as comprising also any person who has the sole and exclusive right to work for the invention in any particular field of its application or in any particular geographical area. That obviously goes on to the salami slicing point. Um, uh, before, um, so uh, just make two observations if I may. Firstly, one certainly doesn't suggest uh, uh, an exclusive licensee would be a person who, along with a number of other people, each of whom had the right to work parts of invention in the same field. Um, uh, and we say that uh, in those circumstances, that person would never have the sole or exclusive uh, right <coughs> to work the invention. On the contrary, there'd be numerous people working the invention because the invention itself has been carved up into numerous slices. Then, uh, as part of Swan's recommendations, uh, the wording for an exclusive license was set out. So if you turn to page 444. Uh, and at uh, section 266.1, one, exclusive license provision set out. So uh, what, what was done was the definition was set out for the purposes of um, doing that which was uh, recommended in paragraph 134, which is all about the enforcement, all that section about enforcement of um, exclusive licenses and infringement actions. Um, and uh, if you go to 454 of, um, sorry, 456, I do apologize. And I should, sorry, 454 is right, right now. The summary of the principal recommendations, that's section 317, 454, and then at 456, uh, in relation to exclusive licensee, the principal recommendation is an exclusive licensee should be enabled to institute proceedings for infringement in his own name, subject to conditions imposed on license by 24 and uh, 27 of the Acts, and to obtain all relief normally available for actual infringement. 24 and 27 aren't material for this dispute, my lords, and my lords may well have picked up, they were 
uh, license to right provisions and the compulsory license, I think, for, for war license. Um, so um, we say the two, two key take home messages from the Swamba Fort are that uh, the purpose of defining the exclusive license and exclusive licensee was to create a new statutory right so the person, that person, for the first time could bring proceedings for infringement of the patent under which he had an exclusive license, so it's been out of compensation for the first time. And secondly, this an exclusive license C had to have the sole and exclusive rights to work the invention in any particular field or any particular application. So, now, um, with that quite detailed background, now I'm probably going to address very briefly now the two points on the exclusive license. I've probably done them already. Um, in, in relation to the first one, then, is the construction of the existing license terms. Um, I think I've probably done that. At heart, we say that um, unless the exclusive licensee can enforce the purported exclusivity, any right given to him is um, largely illusory. The enforcement of that right is integral with the grant of that right. And let me just see. Yeah. A learning genius says I've covered my notes. So unless there's anything else specifically in relation to that, my lords, um, uh, I was then going to go on and deal with my um, second. But some laws. Just bear with me for one second, I may just check I haven't missed anything. Yes, there was just one small point which I should pick up my Lord, Lord Justice Burr's um, comment um, yesterday to my learned friend about um, would it have any impact on um, uh, uh, other intellectual property rights and we largely agree with what my learned friend was saying this morning in relation to that. But it, 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 there is a, a glitch, we say, in relation to copyright. Uh, and I just need to show you the uh, sections relating to copyright, which aren't in the bundle, I'm afraid. So but the, the two that aren't in the bundle are section 92 and section 101. I could make them those up. Section 92, which I hope you see on the first page of that hand up, defines what an uh, exclusive licensee, license is within the Copyright Designs and Patents Act. Um, and um, exclusion of all persons, including persons granting right to exercise a right which would be otherwise exercised for exclusively by the copyright own, owner. Section 101 um, says in relation to an exclusive licensee, an exclusive licensee has, except the copyright owner, the same rights and remedies in respect of matters occurring after grant. They had been an assignment. His rights and remedies are concurrent with the copyright owner um, and should be included accordingly in an action brought by exclusive licensee by virtue of this section. The defendant may avail himself any defence. So, prima facie, that looks um, very similar to what's going on under the um, Patents Act. And therefore, my learning friends correct, even if the exclusive license says that you don't have a right to bring any copyright infringement uh, proceedings, if he's correct, nonetheless, uh, that document would be sufficient to allow that person to bring proceedings under section 101. Um, and that, we say, uh, needs to be uh, borne in mind when one considers the position under 101A, because in an exactly the same license agreement, I want says you can't bring any infringement proceedings, but is no longer now exclusive, but non-exclusive, the uh, provision 101A would prevent that non-exclusive licensee 
streamed proceedings because the license must be in writing and you'll see in 101A B Roman 2 uh, must expressly grant the non-exclusive licensee a right of action under this section. And, and what we say is that what that does is actually it highlights the importance of the contractual terms setting out the nature of the substantive rights between the licensee and the patentee. You can of course have an exclusive license granted by the patentee to a licensee which is silent about enforcement and then prima facie section 67.1 would apply. But if you have a, a license which expressly says you can't enforce, we say it does play into unreality in those circumstances, but nonetheless you can still fall within the scope of section 67.1. And under the Copyright Act, that would, that would apply with exclusive licensee under copyright, but it wouldn't apply in relation to exactly the same agreement in relation to a non-exclusive licensee. We say that would be a very odd outcome. Now, um, now it's going to go on to uh, salami slicing. Okay. Um, uh, and as my lords have already got, it's, uh, ultimately it's a very simple point, and ultimately it's in my lord's hands, because all you've got is a number of first instant decisions, and you've got Swan Report, but effectively you've got, uh, to be frank, carte blanche to decide this. Um, as a matter of um, statutory construction, amongst other things, I uh, hope. Um, and the simple point is we say you can't grant an exclusive license within the meaning of sections 67 and 130, where the grant of the exclusive exclusivity is limited to only a part of the invention as set out in the claim. Um, and uh, we say that the closest that any court prior to you has actually got to this was um, some uh, ob obiter ob uh, observations of um, uh, then Mr. Justice um, uh, Walker, Robert Walker as he was, in Purdue, which a case uh, no doubt my, um, my Lord, Lord Justice Arnold may well recall as he was the junior being led by Mr. Carl in the National Act. And this was a case where the claimants themselves didn't seek to suggest an exclusive license could exist where a claim is divided between a number of different people, but they did seek to assert that a party could become an exclusive licensee if it had an exclusivity in relation to a single claim. In this case, it was claim two. Uh, and on the facts of that case, uh, Lord, uh, Mr. Justice Robert Walker was concerned that dividing up the claims of the patent in such a way to give rise to some unreality in considering the beneficiary could be called an exclusive licensee. Clearly, that person did not have an exclusive right in respect of claim one of the patent. So, in relation to this, is tab that. 18. And so, I'm going to yes. the passage. Yes, so it's, it's tab 18, my lord. It's uh, starting at page uh, 233. Um, and you can pick it up um, uh, at the last paragraph on 233 to give the background to the issue that's going to be then in front of um, uh, Mr. Justice Robert Walker and uh, at the top of 234, the first substantive uh, uh, paragraph, Mr. Carr, um, who put the case up for the plaintiffs on all issues except uh, infringement of the patent, met Mr. Watson's submissions about why um, the, person, the relevant entity in the UK could not be exclusive license. Um, uh, um, it, it, sorry why Purdue's UK was an exclusive licensee. He submitted, Purdue's had an exclusive license granted by Purdue's in 94 for the settlement, and the Procter Government did, did thereby uh, acquire a license, it made a sub-license from Purdue's UK, or now Mernlicher UK. Secondly, he submitted that Mernlicher UK must, on any of you, be an exclusive licensee in respect of claim two of the patent, which unlike claim one is in terms appropriate only to a single DFS. Claim two reads, nappy pants according to claim one characterized and the strength and zone extends over the entire width of the front part of the impermeable sheet. Mr. Watson's repost to this is that, is that rights under patents cannot, as he puts it, be salami-sized in that way, uh, and then... So pausing there, yes. the submission that's recorded there was that you can't even exclusively yes. license a claim. 
A absolutely. And you would have to have an exclusive licence in respect of the entire, entire patent. patent. And, and I don't go that far. And, right. And because I don't need to, because this is a much, much more extreme situation against me here. But, but even in those circumstances, you might not. But the first point I want to make is that, uh, for not whatever reason, it was never asserted in that case that where more than two people had the right to the invention and claim one, one of those was an exclusive licensee. The, the, the fallback, the position was that there's exclusivity in relation to claim two. On the well, on because it wasn't necessary for Mr. Carr to go any further, because he had a claim. Yeah, well, may, relevant embodiment. May, may, maybe so, but the, but the point that's now been put to you is that it was irrelevant, didn't he do that at all? He could have, he could have said, it doesn't matter, I've got a right in relation to claim one, because I've got something, they say part, and that's good enough. That, uh, but even in those circumstances, my lord, what um, Mr. Uh, Justice Robert Walker uh, thought about this, you can see it's 691, uh, the uh, top of the page, I also see some force in Mr. Watson's submissions about slimy slicing of rights under different claims and some unreality on the facts of this case. In viewing Mernicke UK as a possible exclusive licensee of rights under a claim two, but not claim one, which in contrast to claim two refers to one or more strength of zone. Nonetheless, um, should not be, the claim should not be sought out in pursuing the, the contentions on the previous trial. So, so I, I'm, I- The conclusion is it's arguable. It's arguable, absolutely. But that, that, as I'm saying, this, that's as far as it's gone in our researches about this issue. But what I am pointing out is that's not this case. This case is a long way further down the line than that. This case is not saying I can identify a claim, because that would, at least in our respectful submission, accord with the language of the statute, because the invention is that which is uh, identified in the claim. They're saying, I don't need to find a claim. I can find any part within that claim. Any capricious carve up of that claim is sufficient for me to get an exclusive license. Um, and uh, you've got my you've got my general um, submissions relation to this formula. I want to just say, obviously, the judge went in error insofar as he considered that Newham had device divested itself of the right to work the invention. Um, uh, that he found in 140, um, my learned friend, except the judge got wrong in 140 sub 2. Um, uh, and, and it's quite clear because now he said, no, of course, I'm, everyone's allowed to work it. Um, you can work it, they can work it, uh, as long as we carve up a part of that invention. And um, obviously the result of um, that uh, reservation of rights is that what it uh, allows um, new and reserved to itself is all other pharmaceutical forms of a prolonged release melatonin within the claim, including two milligram capsules, solutions, syrups for all use, and all other methods of administration of prolonged melatonin, as expressly considered by the patent in the paragraphs which I've shown you 14 through to 17 of the specification. and as further exemplified by uh, claim two of the patent. Um, so what the license agreement allows is Newham to put on the market a two milligram melatonin product in capture form or solution form, or grant rights to any third party to that. And in those circumstances, it cannot be said with any reality uh, that the um, Flynn product is uh, given any exclusivity in relation to um, a, a market at all. You've got directly competing products in the same field, the same market, within the invention. And just so I'm clear, yes. we're, we're back in the statute of the definition of exclusive license. Any yes. right in respect of the invention. That's right. Any right and in respect of the invention, and the invention is defined by section 125 as that which is in the claim. The individual claim rather yes. than the total. Exactly. So I'm not, I'm yes. not taking the points which um, um, uh, was raised in, um, originally, range, originally caused Mr. Justice Robert Walker concern that uh, you can carve out the patent. Yes. I, I do say I rely on the statutory language which says in right in respect of the, uh, in respect of the invention. And so it is in theory possible to do it um, claim by claim. And 
if you don't, you're left with the nightmare that we say, um, you, which is um, envisaged by enforcement under Section 17, which I've already described. Do you, do you agree that an amendment <coughs> to limit the claim to have two subclaims, one to tablets and one to capsules, would be something that was formally allowable? Uh, it seems to be narrower than the claim. It seems to, there seems to be basis for it in the patent. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to consent to that. All right. In theory, I can. The reason I'm not. Is, 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 no, um, fair enough. You might have to argue about it one day. But, but, uh, but, 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 but there may be arguments about actually what the disclosure was, whether it was only limited. Okay. Patents, whatever. At least broadly, it looks to me. But, as but in you theory, can imagine claims like that. But in theory, my lord, I, I, I take my lord's implicit. This is all horribly artificial argument. Coming down the line, yeah. which is yes, but that's the statute that I've got. Well, but it's also Perdus, though. But per Perdus is Perdus is uh, was concerned about the unreality of looking at the invention in the concepts of, of the patent itself. Well, I understand, but yeah. if you, but if you, it seems to me, I must say, and I understand, I'm not trying to make you make a concession you shouldn't make. Sort of and I'm not trying to do that at all. Uh, but it looks to me as though one could imagine, without any great difficulty, looking at the patent you've shown us, that there could be lots of claims. Absolutely. Tablets, and capsules, and everything else. Right. One doesn't normally see claims like that in patents because they're not very helpful, yeah. and they just clutter it all up. Yeah. But it, but if if the law is as you say it is, that would be a simple way of solving that problem. Yes, it would work. Although what I'm what I'm doing is actually I'm saying that's dog and tail tail wagging the dog. But what actually is, you can claim the invention however you like. Yeah. But when you decide to grant something which is an exclusive license, you've got to ask. What is the purpose of that? What are you granting? It's got to be, what does exclusivity mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the way in which this has been argued before you, on the, on the other side, is that there is no inherent uh, limitation on the division of the invention. There's nothing inventive at all about the division. There's nothing technical about the limitation. And yet the language says, the language of the statute says, um, a right in, uh, any right in respect of the invention. So, what we, I'll go back to what says Swan had in mind, of course, is that um, you're entitled to exploit your monopoly however you like. Fully accept that by granting ex exclusive licenses to man however you like. But the ultimate what that means is you have to commercialize your invention however you like, and you can grant that commercialization rooms wherever you like in any. If you clearly divided fields, but what it's not talking about is dividing up actually the invention itself, so that there can never be an arms trade transmission. On this argument, that there is a risk that there will never be any material limitation in the nature of the competitive rights which are granted to the various exclusive licenses. And so, rather than going down that rabbit hole, rabbit hole, you just actually stick with the statutory language and say. I'm not. I'm not saying that um, that exclusive license is something which is conferring on the licensee, exclusion, or others any right in respect of part of the invention, but only in relation to the invention itself. And that's what language says, and that's what we say. They're stuck. It's not a big hardship. They don't have to grant exclusive licenses. If they want to, they can do. But if they're going to grant them, they have to grant them in respect of the invention, which is that which is claimed. Um, uh, given timing, I was going to go on to costs and this. Um, there are any other points, my lords, of course, in relation to that aspect of the case? So um, then, then. Costs, um, my lords, if I may. Uh, two, two general comments, uh, if I may. Firstly, um, before I address the, claim, the appellant's three grounds of appeal, um, firstly, context, and secondly, law. As to context, my lords, um, the court appreciates that this was a UK claim for infringement of patent, which was commenced by the claimants only after the European Patent Office Opposition Division had found the patent to be invalid. And
And the fact that the claimants could bring this UK claim for infringement was only because the first claimant had appealed the opposition division's decision and therefore had caused that order revoking the patent to be suspended. <coughs> therefore, at all times, during the course of these UK proceedings, the claimants knew that if they were to abandon their appeal, the Board of Appeal, or if the Board of Appeal were to uphold the invalidity of the patent, whether for the same reasons as the opposition division or for different reasons, there would be no relevant right to enforce in this claim. And the claim would therefore be dismissed. The fact that the claim ultimately failed in the UK was because the first claimant decided to abandon their appeal before the Board of Appeal. Whilst those UK proceedings were still before the first instance judge and indeed before the trial judge. The judge was fully aware of the fact that the UK claim failed not as a result of his findings in the trial before him, but as a result of the claimant's acts of abandoning their appeal to the European Patent Office with the consequent effect that the patent was revoked as an issue. The judge took all those matters into account when exercising his discretion as to costs and in those circumstances was entitled to come to the conclusion which he did and we say, and I'll make it good, that the judge neither left out of consideration any particular matter nor took into account a matter which was not relevant and therefore his decision as to costs was not in those circumstances perverse or wrong. Now, as to law, my lords, we've set this out in our skeleton argument at paragraph 53 and 54. This court knows very well that the court at first instance has a wide discretion when awarding costs. My learned friends refer to the summit authority and both quoted paragraph 26 and that this court must first reach the conclusion that the judge's decision was flawed before this court can exercise its discretion afresh. By flawed, we say this court understands that in the manner that Lord Justice Stuart Smith explained in Roach and News Group newspapers, that's the authorities bundle tab 19 at page 256, this being, middle paragraph, this being an appeal on costs with the leave of the judge, the ordinary rules as to review of the judge's discretion apply. The court must not be tempted to interfere with the judge's order merely because we would have exercised the discretion differently from the way in which the judge did. Before the court can interfere, it must be shown that the judge had either erred in principle in his approach or has left out of account or taken into account some feature that he should or should not have considered or that his decision is wholly wrong because the court is forced to the conclusion that he has not balanced the various factors fairly in the scale, relying on the comments of Lord Justice Griffiths in all times. And further, my lords, when making that assessment, this court should also heed the words of Mr Justice Wilson, as he then was in SCT Finance and Bolton, which we've set out in paragraph 53 of our skeleton argument, but in the authorities bundle at tab 21 and it's paragraph 2 there, page 280. This is an appeal brought with leave of the single Lord Justice from the county court in relation to costs. As such, it's overcast from start to finish by the heavy burden faced by any appellate in establishing the judge's decision falls outside the discretion in relation to costs conferred upon him under Rule 44.3.1 of the Civil Procedures Rules 1998. For reasons of general policy, namely it's undesirable for further costs to be incurred in arguing about costs, this court discourages such appeals by interpreting such discretion very widely. And we say, when one looks at the appellate's actual grounds of appeal and arguments, 
that they don't ever overcome any of those hurdles in relation to the judge's findings in relation to costs. Yesterday, um, my learned friend Orally um, put his case uh, on five points. Firstly, he said the judge was wrong to revisit the December order thinking that the EPO result was a material change in circumstances as regards costs. That we understand to be uh, ground two of his um, uh, appeal, as uh, set out in his grounds of appeal. Secondly, the judge was wrong to find Milan was a successful party, as that only took into account the EPO outcome, which he should have ignored. Uh, by doing so, the judge um, uh, ignored the trial judgment. That we understand as part of his ground one, grounds of appeal. Thirdly, that even if Milan was a winner, an alternative order should be made. That we understand to be ground one amended, the one that subsequently has been brought in the last couple of weeks. Fourthly, when considering the alternative order, the judge did not take the trial judgment into account. That again seems to be ground one as amended. And fifthly, even if Milan were the winner, uh, the judge should have taken an issue-based approach, and that we understand is ground three of their grounds of appeal. So uh, I was intending to, given the logical order, I was intending to address ground two of his appeal, then ground one, and then finally deal with ground three. Um, as to um, ground two of his appeal, this is formally that the 16th of December 2020 order should not have been varied as a matter of discretion. And in their written submissions, they make three points. They say there was no explicit or implicit agreement or understanding that the orders should be revisited. Secondly, there was no need to revisit uh, because Section 61 relief fell away. And thirdly, even if there had been a need to revisit, there was no material change in circumstances which would cause the cost order to be revisited. Um, and uh, as I understand my learned friend, orally yesterday he concentrated on the third. He didn't mention the first two, but, uh, but he, didn't, he, he didn't formally abandon them. I can deal with them very briefly. Um, the, the, the first point is ultimately irrelevant as to whether or not there was or wasn't an explicit or implicit agreement to revisit. And so for, for my, my Lord's notes, we've addressed this in our skeleton argument, uh, these, these points at 94 through to 99 our skeleton. Um, and um, it, it is ultimately relevant because the court had jurisdiction under CPR 317, which the appellants accepted the court had jurisdiction to exercise. Uh, that's common ground. However, we do say the judge was right um, in uh, his judgment at um, paragraph 59D that it was clear that at the hearing on the 16th of December 2020, at least uh, was implicitly conducted on the basis that the orders could and would, if appropriately, be revisited, because of, amongst other reasons, firstly, Mylan's express position set out in our skeleton argument, quoted at paragraph 32 of the March judgment, that that was the way in which we were conducting the um, hearing in 16th of December, and secondly, the judge's express discussion he had with counsel which the judge himself quotes at paragraph 59D, pages 227 and 228 of the judgment, um, of the bundles, uh, where the judge used the language both provisional and present thinking. Secondly, um, uh, their argument there's no need to revisit the order because section 61 relief fell away. Uh, that's wrong because the 16th of December order uh, did not address the provisions relating to delivery up and destruction upon oath, as the judge correctly found and held in the March judgment at paragraph 50 sub 8. Um, and um, it, it, I, I can make that good, my lords, which we're addressed in paragraph 97 of our skeleton. I'm conscious of the time, um, but um, uh, uh, not only was the judge right about that, but just for my lords' notes, um, Mr. Justice Mead also found that to be the case in his preliminary issues judgment and that's in the Joint Authorities, tab 15, page 172, paragraph 84, Roman 2. And secondly, it's wrong in any event because Milan had to be released from the undertakings they'd given to the court 
not to enter into any further sales of melatonin myelin products. And that uh, undertaking um, one can see in uh, tab 12 at page 214, and the judge addressed that in his judgment at paragraph 59, Roman 2. And then that leads on to the third point, which was one concentrated orally by my learned friend yesterday. But even if there had been a need to revisit, there's no material change in circumstances which caused the cost order to be revisited. Um, uh, uh, for the reasons we've just been discussing, there was a need to revisit the 16th of September 2020 order. Mm -hmm. The judge had jurisdiction to revisit it. He made clear that when revisiting it, he thought that the claimant's arguments, if he thought the claimant's arguments were correct in relation to costs, he would simply remake the same provisions in his new order. And that again is in the judgment at paragraph 39, at page 206, tab 12. There's no error there. Uh, the next question, given he had to review the order, did he err by reviewing the cost aspects as well? Uh, and we say it's important to understand that the claimants did not contend before the judge in the February 2021 hearing that resulted in the March judgment, that the judge had to review the 16th September 2020 order, he should sever his consideration of the cost aspect. That their position was there's no material change of circumstances at all, which entitled the court to review the 16th September 2020 order at all, because it was foreseeable that the patent might be revoked. So on the claimant's case, there were sunset clauses for the injunction, and since there were no similar sunset clauses for the provision for costs, therefore the cost should be left alone as it had already been pre-considered. That argument uh, was uh, wrong and was rightly rejected by the judge uh, because the reason already addressed, there was need to come back to review the order in relation to destruction, delivery up and the undertakings. And specifically addressed in relation to costs, uh, and the judge correctly addressed this argument in his judgment at paragraph 59, 50, sub 9, Roman 4. So uh, it was never part of the claimant's case before the judge that somehow the cost order should somehow be severed from the order generally. Rather, if the order was to be reviewed, their position was that the same order as to cost should be made again. Um, now, as I understand my learned friend's um, uh, uh, submissions, uh, they are contending that the material change of circumstances did not go to costs, um, uh, that the revocation of the patent was not a change that materially affected the costs order. And as I understand my own friend's argument, he suggests that in light of um, my Lord Lord Justice Burr's uh, observations in Optis, there must be a relationship between the change of circumstances relied on and the conclusion reached. But there was here, and the judge knew there was here, prior to the revocation of the patent, the claimants were the winners and obtained all the substantive relief uh, they could possibly get in the claim uh, against Milan. After the revocation of the patent, after the abandonment of the appeal, the claimants were the lo losers, because they had obtained none of the relief they were seeking, and Milan were the winners um, because they obtained everything commercially and legally which they could be entitled to claim. Clearly, therefore, the abandonment of the appeal and the consequent revocation of the patent was a direct link which altered the outcome of the proceedings and which would be reflected in costs. That then leads me on, that's the first, second ground of appeal. Then I'm going to go into the first ground of appeal, um, which is um, my, my learned friend's suggestion that uh, the judge was wrong to find Milan uh, the successful party. Um, again, my Lord's notes, we've addressed this in paragraph 66 to 78 of our um, uh, of our um, submissions uh, and uh, just make a number of general points if I can first my lords um, under CPR 44.24 court must take into account all the circumstances of the case not just the outcome from the trial uh, the winner or the successful party is to be answered in a real life sense not by some technical term and on the facts here, Milan clearly was the winner by the time the final order came to be made because the appellant's abandonment of their EPO appeal meant that the patent was held to be void ab initio. There was no right that Milan could be said to ever have infringed. Secondly, the appellants uh, were thus not entitled to any relief for patent infringement against Milan, as my Lord, Lord Justice Arnold observed. That's recited in the recitals in the 30th of 
December order and also again in the um, March order. Thirdly, Milan had achieved all they possibly could from the UK proceedings. Fourthly, um, there was, uh, as a result, uh, there was nothing for Milan to appeal. And fifthly, commercially, Milan had a melatonin product on the marketplace, and there were um, no existing rights prevent Milan from, exist, from um, selling that product. So legally and commercially, Milan were uh, undoubtedly, we say, the winners and the judge was right to so find. In this uh, aspect of the case, um, trying to unpack what my learned friend said orally and also in his written submissions, we, it seems that he effectively makes five points, and I'm going to address them one, one at a go, one at a time. <laughs> Uh, firstly, and this is paragraph 77 of his skeleton argument, um, th they suggest that the judge focused only on the remedies and relief um, and ignored the fact that Milan had lost the UK trial. Well, we say that's just a, a total mischaracterization of what the judge was doing and, and as reflected in the judgment. The judgment, judge makes clear in his judgment that at all times he was aware that Milan had lost the trial. And you can see that in his judgment at, for example, paragraphs 69, 75, and 77, um, the, uh, the last sentence. I can take you to these lords, or, or um, I can let my lords. Um, I, I suspect, given the time constraints, okay. you're better leaving us to look at them okay. afterwards. OK. Uh, uh, the judge clearly had in mind <coughs> that as a result of the UK trial, the claimants would have been the winners. He says that in terms. Um, uh, and. Uh, but that was to ignore the reality of the revocation of the patent. The second point um, my learned friends suggest, which uh, comes down to paragraph 79 of their skeleton, is that the cost order ought to reflect what happened in the English proceedings. We say that the cost order does reflect what happened in the English proceedings. The appellants lost the English proceedings by not having a patent right in the UK to enforce. That came about because the first claimant abandoned the appeal for the European Patent Office, and thus the patent was revoked ab initio. And that was the result that was recognised and embodied in the 30th of December 2020 order, uh, where the uh, all orders were revoked, and um, the, the, as, as I was indicated, the, the, uh, there was a recognition that um, by the claimants that they weren't attached to any substantive relief. Um, what the claimants are really complaining about is not that the um, uh, uh, cost order ought to reflect what happened in the English proceedings, but what the cost order should reflect and be limited only to the outcome of the English trial. And that ignores the fact that by the time of the make and final order, the claimants had no material right to enforce the patent and could not obtain any relief against Milan. The third uh, aspect of the, the appellant's argument is that they suggest that the judge ignored his findings in the trial judgment when addressing costs. But with great respect to my own friend, that was exactly what um, the contention was before the judge and what he was seeking to address in the cost judgment. It wasn't an error of principle that he considered that the argument that um, uh, Milan had lost the trial uh, but won the war, uh, but considered on the facts before him that the appropriate cost order was that you should pay the costs. He was entitled to come to that conclusion. Uh, it's not he ignored the findings, he just he took them into account and was entitled to come to a different conclusion. The judge did not, as a matter of principle, <coughs> did not find as a matter of principle that a winner before the European Patent Office would always get their costs in the UK proceedings. On the contrary, uh, and if, if my lords go to paragraph 100, uh, goes paragraph 91, three of the judgment. That's in the exclusive license bundle tab 12. Page 240. And you see the middle of that paragraph. Um, 
his, his uh, talking about the possibilities of the outcome uh, uh, of, of the EPO uh, as opposed to the UK proceedings, and then he says, um, uh, in, in my judgment, about five lines down, my judgment, in not seeking to engage with the court on the question of the German, each of the parties assume the risk of costs being wasted and of costs being made that follow the outcome of the interaction between the UK and EPO proceedings as opposed to the reasoning, whatever it might be, of the UK proceedings. I do not say that an outcome-based order will always or even generally be the right one, although in this case I consider it to be the correct starting point when assessing the instance of cost for the reasons I've given. Uh, and the Newham can't complain given that those costs have been wasted. It may be a point you want to deal with later, but um, it could be suggested that the reasoning in subparagraph 3 doesn't lead to the conclusion that suggests, because summarising it briefly in my own words, what he's saying there is that the costs of the trial were wasted because the parties failed to alert the court to the expedition of the TEA here. And he says, and I don't think there's any dispute about that, that each party was equally at fault in that regard. Now, he seems to take the view that that supports the order that you made, but it might be suggested that actually that would lead to a different order, namely no order as to costs. Well, it, it might be, but he's entitled to take it into account in both ways, because at this point he's effectively saying um, that uh, he, he considered here that uh, Newham could have avoided that outcome. And... and which he's, was, he's, he's just found that it's both parties' fault. So why, why is it fair then to single out Newham? Well, ultimately it was fair to single out Newham, because Newham, of course, had the, uh, had the choice to bring proceedings in the first place. Milo had no option but to defend them. And they had the choice to bring proceedings in circumstances where the patent had already been held invalid by the uh, opposition division, and in circumstances where, of course, they'd failed to get an interlocutory relief because um, money was said to be an adequate remedy. In great respect. It, well, sorry, can we yeah. disentangle those two points? Yes, of course. I, I, I understand your point. They sued after the patents had already been found yep. invalid by the opposition division. They didn't have to do that. I, I, I understand that point. Where it goes to is another matter, but I understand sure. the point. But then you're making a point about the fact that they failed to obtain interim relief because damages were held to be an adequate remedy. What's the relevance of that? The relevance of that is that um, their right was comp always compensatable in money terms. So waiting for the outcome of the uh, Board of Appeal will not have materially prejudiced them. Whereas Milan had no option but to defend this because otherwise Milan would be prevented from going on the market. Uh, I thought the only, well, one of the important reasons why they failed to get an interim injunction is because of the speedy trial. But, but, but what he was saying, yes, but what he was saying is that this, the speedy trial and the TBA were coming on within the same approximate time. Right. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, the, the, there was blame on Newham because um, they they could and uh, have sought a stay of the a stay of the um, uh, UK proceedings if they so desired, bearing in mind the proximity of the TBA hearing in circumstances where it had already been held that in this time frame their losses were quantifiable by money terms. So, so the point I'm uh, making is that it's not as if the judge is finding as a matter of principle here that the winner before the uh, EPO would always get their costs in the UK proceedings. But he did find on the facts of this particular case that they did. And um, I in relation to that, um, I make these submissions, of which were in the mind of the judge, we say. Firstly, that Milan was already the overall winner. He's already come to that conclusion. Uh, secondly, um, Newham was proceeding in these UK proceedings knowing that it had to win in the EPO, as just made by Lord, Lord Justice Arnold. Um, 
uh, to have any enforceable right in the UK. Thirdly, Newham knew that the outcome of the TBA was going to be heard very soon after the uh, outcome of the UK trial. Fourthly, Newham could have chosen to seek a stay. They went to this with their eyes open. And by not doing so, Newham went into the UK trial knowing that there was potentiality for the UK trial to be rendered unnecessary. So we do say, in the very special circumstance of this case, it was open to the judge um, uh, to consider that Newham could have avoided the UK trial and costs by asking for stay on adjournment pending the TBA hearing. Fourthly, the appellant's suggestion in paragraph 77 of their skeleton that the judge only considered the uh, remedies and relief when considering the um, outcome. Uh, and that's not correct, because the judge considered, um, firstly, that Newham had been successful at trial. That, as I said, is judgments, amongst other things, paragraph 69 and 77. Um, secondly, um, Newham's abandonment of the appeal meant that there was no enforceable patent. It's a judgment 75 to 80. Thirdly, the conduct of the EPO proceedings by both sides, that's uh, paragraphs 82 to 84 of the judgment. And uh, fourthly, the conduct of the parties in the UK proceedings generally, that's paragraphs uh, 85 to uh, 92. But having considered all of that, in our respectful submission, ultimately, what's wrong with considering the remedies and relief outcome? Because as to the winner of the UK proceedings, what else was the judge meant to be doing to determine the winner? Uh, right. Um, fifthly, um, the appellant's suggest, suggestion that the remedies and relief is the wrong approach for assessing who is the winner when assessing costs, um, <coughs> what we say is just not correct. The judge was obliged under 44.2.2a to consider who is a successful party. The judge was obliged under 44.2.4 to regard all the circumstances, including the conduct of the parties. Uh, that's 42.5. Um, 42.5 states specifically the conduct of the parties includes acts prior and during the course of the entire proceedings. Um, and um, the judge uh, correctly set out um, the law as to who the successful party was at paragraph 74 of this judgment, which was who is a matter of substance and reality won. Uh, and we say um, that was um, Milan, and he was right to come to that conclusion. Um, I've given the reasons for that already. Um, uh, and uh, that's not an error of principle. We had regard to all the remedies and relief outcome and deciding who is the overall winner. And also we point to, uh, in our uh, written submissions at paragraph 77 and 78, that Mr Justice Mead also came to the same conclusion uh, and the fact that he came to the same conclusion when considering uh, the similar circumstances to who's the winner, we say is further evidence this is not an error of principle, but it's a judgment that the first instance judge was entitled to come to on the facts before him. Uh, um, that was going to, then I'm going to go on to um, ground one as amended, which I think encompasses my learned friend's third and fourth points um, of, um, as he made orally, we've addressed in our, in our scope's argument of paragraph 79 to 85. Um, <coughs> uh, and this is the, the judge uh, conclusion that there are no other factors to justify a different order was wrong. Uh, and we say um, before the judge, each of the parties contended that they were the winners. That is uh, recited correctly in the judgment at paragraph 72.1 and also at paragraph 69 of the judgment. The, the appellants did not expressly submit in their written or oral submissions that if they were not the winner, an alternative cost order in substance should be made under 44.2.2b, either in their written or all submissions. But nonetheless, the judge did understand that that was in effect what he was being asked by the appellant's counsel as a third limb of his oral submissions before the court to do, 
and I should show you uh, the transcript so that this, this court fully understands what the appellants were actually asking for judge to do on this cost order. And that you can see from the uh, supplemental bundle, tab um, supplemental bundle, tab eight. Picking it up from page 167 of the bundle, internal transcript page 121. And if I pick it up at uh, line 17, the judge was asking um, the appellant's counsel, Mr. Wall, you're entirely properly running the series of traverses in terms of how I should deal with the discretion on costs. I'm quite keen just for my own benefit, to untangle the layers of your argument, because when I come to give judgment, I want to be quite clear about the points I'm addressing when. It seems to me that you are running three different lines. Your first line, I think your primary case, is that the date of the order that I make, and I'm now remaking, does not matter. I simply have to take, I have to look to 44.2 at the outcome of the proceedings before me, i.e. the trial winners knew and succeeded. Uh, correct. Secondly, uh, Marcus and the judge then said, I look at, the, look at the fact you won, he lost, I take into account the relevant factors in terms of the conduct of the proceedings before me, and I adjust the costs to follow the winner outcome in that light. So if there's been a need for an issue-based cost order, or there's been a late point, or if there's some other uh, way in which a default line should be adjusted, I take that into account in the usual way. But the touchstone is it does not matter whether I'm deciding this in November or in December or in January, or whenever it simply took, took I simply, sorry, it is simply look at my judgment, look at the proceedings before me, and decide the issue of the costs accordingly. Yes, my lord. So that's the trial is the outcome. Then, then it says, you can tell me what, uh, what order you are putting them in, but that's, that's one. Your second line of argument is the date does, does matter, and there is some significance in the fact that I heard and made orders, albeit all orders, on the 16th of December, but you told me that there was an infringed patent as the 16th of December 2020. What appears to be the essence of your point on the second line of argument is that uh, actually you had a judgment in your favour, you banked it, and because you got an order, albeit an oral order on the 16th of December, the subsequent events just do not matter, and I should just leave them out of account for that reason. That's the, that's the no material change of circumstance um, order, so just is stuck with the 16th of December order. That, Mr. Wall says yes. Then the third line is that you are wrong on points one and two, then I'd need to look at the totality of the position, including the particular, in, in particular, including in particular, why the court has ended up in this unsatisfactory position. And I say that without criticism, but it's obviously an unsatisfactory position, as Floyd, Lord Justice Floyd recognised in IPCOM. So we've got parallel outcomes that have come to fruit at the same time. And I should, on this third basis, consider why it is that we have got there. Here, you say, clearing the way becomes relevant because it's an opportunity which Mr. Van Higgins' clients had in order to avoid the unsatisfactory outcome we are at. I think that is your third line of argument. Now have I, Mr. Wall, can I add to that third one? It's not just clearing the way. We invited them to stay the proceedings pending the EPO, and they said they were not prepared to do that, even though they were offered across unseen damages. That last line is wrong. They didn't offer cross unseen damages, it's yeah. common ground. Um, the only cross unseen damages were offered on the interim injunction stage. Um, Mr. Justice Smith, yes, I'm sorry. I was using your clearing the way, as it were, as shorthand for all of the points you make against Mr. Van Hegen in order to explain why it is that my costal discretion <coughs> should be excised in your favour rather than the other way. Other way. Uh, yes, and could I just ask him well, just to read down to 125 line 8. So, so um, what under this third limb he seems to be asking is that if, if mine is the winner, I must look at all the circumstances and how he got there, and when considering the proper order, must take into account clearing the way and the stay of proceedings and so forth. Um, now, the judge 
also had that clearly in mind in his judgment. And he says that at um, paragraph 68 of his judgment. setting out, obviously, the, the structure of the cost. Um, the last sentence, however, the court, uh, having, having worked out who the winner is, however, the court can make a different order. And he has that clearly in mind when you look at uh, paragraph 79 of his judgment, second sentence. Um, and this is, accordingly at this stage, I, says, I conclude that Milan is in very clearly a successful party. However, I consider that this is, in the circumstances of the present case, a soft and not a hard conclusion. And I need to consider more, most carefully whether and if so, to what extent a different cost order ought to be made to reflect extremely unusual circumstances of this case. In short, I treat this as a cost order that I should make unless it's disposed by other factors. So he clearly had it in mind. He, 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 um, uh, and then he was asked to consider, well, what other factors do the appellants contend he should have taken into account and failed to do so? That is illuminating, because we can see it in my learned friend's skeleton argument at paragraph 91. So that's back in the exclusive um, license bundle, page 25 of the bundle, and pick it up in paragraph 91st. So in effect, judge was doing what he said he was not intended to do. He was singling out you know, particular blame because neither side applied for stay. When deciding there were no factors that would lead him to consider a different cause order, the judge wrongly failed to take account of the following. And these are set out in paragraph 91. These, this is what the, the base of their appeal is. Um, they say, first, the judge should not take into account the fact that parents had offered a stay pending the EPO save as to costs, if Myland would agree to delay launch. Secondly, Myland, Myland had rejected that offer and found to make clear it was preparing to launch in the UK regardless. And third, that Myland did launch in the UK at risk in September 2020 without clearing the way or waiting for the conclusion of the appeal, uh, which at that stage had been fixed in December 2020. Having overlooked these factors, the judge held the appellants must bear the costs wasted. So uh, they say that he fell into error by uh, overlooking those two factors, and they say that's uh, um, a, 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 a flawed exercise of his discretion. Well, the simple answer to that uh, appeal is the judge did take these factors into account, and there was no error of principle. But rather, having taken them into account, he did not consider that having found to be Milan, Milan to be the winner, that these further factors caused him to um, make a different order within 44.2.2b, and that was something he was entitled to do. It's not an error of principle. Rather, it's the appellants asking this court to substitute their own judgment instead of the first instance judge without identifying uh, the error first. And I need to show you um, uh, how and why the judge took these two factors into account, expressly and or implicitly. And you can see that again from the March judgment back at tab 12, starting at page 238. And picking up at 85, of, if you will be so kind, my lords, um, th this was this was a hard fought pattern. this was hard fought pattern litigation each side suggested the other had spurned one or more opportunities of saving costs by for instance avoiding or rendering unnecessary the trial before me in the UK proceedings thus and I raise these purely by way of example Neurim contended that Milan's failure to clear the way by early revocation action instead of merely opposing the pattern in the EPO would have rendered the trial or at least in the form it took unnecessary for what it's worth that is probably right on this basis, there would have been a fair, far earlier trial with an outcome, at least in the UK, well before uh, the time my judgment was handed down. But that was a factor which, therefore, he expressly took into account. Mr. Van Egan, I know you're going quickly yes. because you've got a little bit of time. Yes, I'm quite sure. But it's all right. But, um, and I know you say, you made your point, but you say that your opponents didn't raise the issue based costs order. I understand. I can come to that, exactly. Mm -hmm. Can I just. Yes. When you do, you need, to, you need to look at paragraph 80 of the judgment. As far as I'm concerned, on the face of it, it looks as though even if you're right that they didn't raise it, the judge did consider it anyway and rejected it. Uh, 
Yes, I, I, that's, I, I'm going to come to it, okay. Lord. That's, okay. that's my, um, that's doing the third round, and okay. I've, I've got that on board, I hope, <laughs> but let's skip over that. At the moment, I'm we just want... on a slightly earlier point, if I may, which is the, um, the suggestion that uh, uh, a different order should have been made, which, which is different from an issue-based one, namely, there, on their grounds of appeal, they're saying not that an issue-based order made, should be made, but a different order should be made, by the judge, and they complain the judge failed to take into account two matters. Mm -hmm. And what I'm putting to this court, if I may, is that that's just wrong because the judge did take them into both. But both those matters were taken into account expressly or implicitly. Mm -hmm. um, the first one, as I said, is paragraph 85, where they are um, addressing uh, uh, the launching at risk, the um, failure to clear the way. And the second one, um, my lord, um, is at um, paragraph 86 of the same judgment where the judge was considering another example. Um, he says, to take another example, Newham suggested that Milan had at some point, but even as late as June or July 2020, when the hearing before the Technical Board of Appeal was expedited, undertaken not to import or sell the infringing products, as far as the UK proceedings might have been avoided, or at least adjourned pending the outcome of the EPO proceedings. Again, this is probably right. So th this is, in essence, I exactly what uh, Milan friends are complaining the judge didn't consider. He is considering here that Milan were, did spurn an opportunity of a stay. Uh, he hasn't, he hasn't um, expressly stated this, the opportunity was by accepting the offer made by Newham in March 2020, or indeed, but what he is saying is that that, that that opportunity could have occurred any time prior to Milan's launch, which uh, did not in fact take place until September 2020. And um, the judge had already made clear in um, his discussions with the claimant's counsel that he had these points clearly in mind, um, and that's the transcript I've just shown you, where uh, the judge was being told about um, um, uh, clearing the way and the, the stay in the transcript I've just shown you. Uh, right. So, not an error principle, um, and uh, uh, n n no evidence that the judge failed to take into account uh, any relevant factor. Uh, now um, I am going to go on to um, the uh, issue-based uh, the, the issue based uh, order contention. And again, uh, we, we've addressed this in uh, paragraphs uh, 101 and 103 of our um, skeleton argument. I think I want to make um, six general points. Uh, this was a question of discretion for the judge. There was no error, of, secondly, there's no error of principle. The claimants did not actually contend in substance before the first instance judge for an issue based cost order. Nor, in fact, do the claimants uh, seek an issue based cost order in any of their four appellants' notices before this court. There are, as I say, literally four pence notices for this court, and for my Lord's notes, in the cost core bundle, tab 1, page 11, at page, tab 2, page 23, tab 3, page 35, and tab 4, page 47, not one of those asks for a, 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 an issue base a payment of costs. They all ask for all of their costs. Um, in their skeleton argument um, before this court, paragraph 94, uh, the appellant suggests that the judge, that this court can make an issue based um, uh, uh, cost order. Can I ask my lords just to look at that paragraph, please? Paragraph 94 of their, their skeleton argument. Exclusive license bundle. Paragraph 94. This ground is advanced as an alternative to the ground above, and it rises if the court concludes the judge correctly determined that Milan is a successful party for the purposes of 4422A. In this scenario, the appellants say the correct approach would be an issue based cost order, such as that followed in, in cases such as Hospira. In this approach, if this approach is held to be the correct one, a cost schedule can be produced and could be determined either by this court or uh, remitted to the trial judge. Of course, no such 
cost schedule was ever put before um, the first instance judge, because before the first instance judge, the um, appellants were always seeking that they should get all their costs. And what we say the appellants do not explain is how uh, it can be said that um, the court below fell into error in failing to exercise um, its uh, discretion in relation to this when they themselves didn't give the underlying materials to that judge to make an issue-based cost order and indeed instead asked for their costs um, uh, at all times. Now, um, what um, my lords have seen is how that um, played out in front of uh, the first instance judge. Firstly, by the claimant skeleton, the highest they've got in terms of saying they want an issue-based cost order was paragraph 10.7 of their uh, supplemental um, uh, sorry, paragraph 10, sub 7 of their um, skeleton argument before the judge. That's in the supplemental under 11, page 240, which we've already been to, and the court's already observed in relation to that. And so far as it asks for an issue-based cost order, it's asking for all of their costs. Um, in so far as um, the matter was then uh, presented before the trial judge, the transcript again is quite clear that the claimants perpetually asked, said that in relation to an issue-based order um, that should not change the landscape, they, the claimants should get all of their costs. So can I show you the relevant parts of the transcript in relation to that? That's in the supplemental bundle tab 8. And Page, page 157 of the bundle, page 83 of the internal page of the transcript. Um, well, these are the passages that we looked at this morning. They are, and I just want, I, I was just checking a little more, Lord. So, at the point at the top of 80, page internal 84 is that um, you did, uh, um, uh, this, uh, Mr. War saying, you did not run this layperson um, argument. If there's an issue-based uh, assessment, even after the EPA the vote, um, it does not change the landscape because of the issue-based fought in the UK lost. So yes, so it that, was accepted. That was yeah. the same submission as in the skeleton. Right, right. And um, so just just make so I'll give you the note. The mod that the, the other passages are um, page uh, 173 of the of the uh, bundle. Uh, internal transcript pages 146, line 25 to 147, line 19, and uh, page. Sorry, I'm not sure. I have we have seen those before. That was 146 to 147. Wasn't That's it? right. So page 173. So I don't know. I don't. You did. Don't you wish on this one? No. Um, I, I, I don't take any matter further, but it just reinforces the same point again. So, uh, so, so we guess even if one decided to run this on an issue by issue basis, yeah. you would see it was not a new point and so on. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm grateful. And um, I note the last one, I think it's internal page 151. Which, yes. We've seen that, we have seen that. So, saw that this morning, I think 151. Yeah. I don't think we have seen 151 either, actually. Unless my system has broken down. So, what 151, that starts, sorry, that starts at, I may have misheard, my lord, I do apologise. So, the one I was asking to look at in addition to uh, 
the one at 147 is at 151, which starts at, I think, line four, internal page 151, uh, substantive page 174 of the bundle. And the second point, this is again uh, Mr. Uh, War. The second point I wish to make, my Lord, is this in terms of there being some phantom appeal. Let's say there was a national appeal to the court appeal and enable them to say, look, because of the court's TBA, we're the overall winner. My submission to the court appeal, which I submit as the right submission to make, is look, we are going to approach this on an issue by issue basis. On every issue that you ran before the first instance judge, Mark Smith, Mr. Justice Mark Smith, you lost everything infringement, insufficiency, anticipation, obviousness. They were all decided against you. Now, as this notional court appeal, where there's a new point which you elected not to run, fine, we're, we're, we're going to say we're going to notionally hold it successful because we have we have to, but we do not think you're going to get all the cost below the other two layers of the argument that I have. First of all, you really should have run this point along with, along if you thought it was worth running. You did not. The case, as it was presented before Mark Smith, was roundly rejected. So yes, we'll give you the cost after judgment and before the Court of Appeal, which of course are notionally nothing, because we've not been in the Court of Appeal, but you're not going to get the costs before the first instance judge. Um, so on that basis, if you go down this notional appeal route, you end up in a situation whereby they end up paying all our costs anyway, there are the two points I would reinforce to my Lord for funding on the question of permission to appeal. So whichever way uh, they, they cut the argument, they were uh, put in before um, uh, the first instance judge so that they should get all their costs. And there was no um, serious attempt to suggest that an issue-based order should be made at all by them. Now, our position was different. We, we said... Um, we should get all our costs, but as a fallback position, we should get 82% um, of our costs um, uh, on an issue-based deduction for failing on the inventive step arguments. Now, my Lord's been shown that evidence this morning. That was Mr. Wall's sixth witness statement, uh, and that's at um, paragraphs 49 to 54. It was also in our skeleton argument before the judge uh, that's uh, at paragraphs 54 to 56 of our skeleton argument, uh, and that's in the supplemental bundle, tab 12 at page 278, and it was also <coughs> referred to um, by us orally in the transcript, and that's supplemental bundle, tab 8, page um, 154. Sorry, let me just check, that's the right way round. Just following your logic for a moment. Yes. You say 18% deduction. Yeah. I mean, that of itself might be thought to justify the 36% deduction in the sense that you should be bearing 18% of your costs and you should be paying 18% of their costs. Well, uh, again, it's a matter of discretion as to how judges deal with it. Um, in, uh, these two judges know that there's a sort of practice in the patents court, which is not it's just, just a practice, it's not a rule of law, that um, uh, often a party is deprived of their costs if they didn't win on it. But that doesn't necessarily mean they will necessarily pay the yeah, other, the other side's costs. And that depends well, on... Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Exactly. Depends on the yes. circumstances exactly. of the case. Exactly. And uh, the, point, the point you were making in that submission to the judge yeah. below is that you were recognising that although you can contend that you won on sufficiency, because that was the basis of the, of the EPO's decision, sufficiency, and never, never mind getting into granularity yeah. about what sort of sufficiency, and you can also contend that you won on novelty because that was the basis of which the opposition division it's tough to say you've ever won on obviousness. And that was the basis of that submission. You were yes, exactly, as, as a fallback position. The issue. Exactly. So he fully had it before him, and he took a view. He could have taken that as a route, yeah. and, and he decided he didn't. Uh, it, was our, it was our second position. Okay. Um, what, what I'm struggling with is what, how the reason the judge gave for not taking that route fits with the point that I put to you, that you didn't win on obviousness. No, we, we didn't, didn't win on our business. <laughs> we didn't win on anything at the trial. I mean, on, on one view... But on any view, you never won on business, ever. Well, well, well actually, that's not true. I think oh, you won on business in Norway, actually. Yeah. 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 On this panel. Oh, there you are. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I don't think you want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Norway? Or <laughs> Sweden? <laughs> 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 um, but, but <laughs> the relevant <laughs> proceeding. <laughs> Absolutely right. Um, sorry, I lost track. So uh, 
it was open to obviously the, the judge to take um, uh, the other side's view, which we lost everything that we filed, and they're sure we should we shouldn't get any money at but all. You think you're doing better on obviousness. If you if you'd won the trial, hmm. you're the winners of the trial trial. Yeah. As yeah. Well, uh, there's a pretty high chance you wouldn't have, at least you wouldn't have recovered your costs of obviousness, ne never mind where it would have gone. But the, and that was the recognition of your submission on, on an issue based order before the judge. Uh, if it's going to be treated in that, in that way. Yes, exactly. But, but, what, but what I'm struggling with yes. is why you should be in a better position in relation to those costs as a result of what happened in the EPR. But, 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 because, and all the conduct and everything else. But because, because effectively it became an all or nothing decision for both sides Why? before the judge, because because what the judge fairly had in mind is that, uh, um, in essence, the whole of the UK trial proceedings had been a waste of time. They've been pointless. They've been rendered unnecessary. Right. Uh, and that's because the abandonment of the patent two days later meant that there was no right to enforce. Uh, and therefore, he was being asked, um, it, 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 having that in in mind. Is it appropriate that they get all their costs? Is it appropriate, on my side, we get all our costs? Or as a possible fallback position is that, well, um, possibly you can think, you could try to do it on the basis, well, notionally we won at large on anticipation, at least we won at large on um, uh, uh, insufficiency, but um, lost on uh, invalidity. But the judge thought about that and said, that's, that's actually completely unreal, because how can I delve into that? How can I make that sort of decision? Because I don't actually know what the TBA has done. Um, I just know that you've abandoned the patent. The other side is saying, you lost on all your insufficiency arguments because the argument you won in, in front of the TBA was a different argument. That was their submission. Um, and, um, and they ignored the fact the patent's being revoked for um, anticipation. And, uh, 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 on that basis, they didn't try to suggest well, actually there's a different way you can slice this. You can, you can slice it in a different way by saying, actually, you should be taking these different factors into account. That, that wasn't for him, wasn't wasn't argued in that way. Well, and, well, one problem, as I'm sure yeah. you're alive to, is that the reason that the judge gives for not adopting an issues-based approach is hard to, to understand. Yes. Yeah, I, I, and there are parts of the judgment which are, which are hard to understand, but but it's not surprising in the context of what I've, I've been submitting to you that he, he did that. It's not a perverse decision for him to come to. He was entitled to come to it as a matter of uh, discretion. And and the overarching points are the ones I've, I've hopefully I've been trying to make all along the line, that he knew it at the outset that uh, this was a contingent right, which was um, like a limping right, which was about to co completely collapse if they abandoned the appeal. He, he knew that the appeal uh, and the trial were coming on roughly at the same time, the proximity of time. And he knew that uh, neither party had um, sought a stay in light of that, and therefore the parties were at risk as to the UK proceedings being a complete waste of time. Those were all factors he clearly had in mind, and he was entitled to have in mind, and he exercised discretion. may not be the way that my lords would have exercised discretion, but he exercised discretion having those factors in mind. <coughs> And said, in his view, these UK proceedings have been a complete waste of time, and the the, out, the overall winner is undoubtedly my man. I look at all the other factors that have been raised in relation in relation to what other um, uh, orders should be made. I haven't disregarded anything. So, in so pursuing that thought, I can understand your submission that the judge concluded that the trial in England was a waste of time. I see why you made that submission. I also follow why, on your submission, that supports the view that an issue-based assessment was not appropriate. But what, why would it not lead to the alternative of making no order as to costs, well, given that he seemed to accept that both parties were at fault in that regard? Well, it, it could have done, but no one asked for that, and no one suggested it. And therefore, is he wrong? Not is he wrong independently to come to that? No, as a matter of principle, it's in his discretion. All of these are all of these are are orders that could reasonably have been made. 
I think what bothers me at the moment, yes. Mr. Thinking about that is that and, and, and I'm not trying to mischaracterise the judgment. My, my, my understanding of the judgment is that the reason he ordered your client to get their costs was because you were the winner, but not because not because of conduct. He ordered the reason for it is because of that, and his, he was very careful in his conduct thing not to say that he was singling out one side. So what I'm struggling with is, is the, way, the way you're putting it is as if his conclusion on costs wasn't that you were the, wasn't, you didn't get your costs because you were the winners, you got the costs because the conduct favoured you, not them. No, no, that's not what he did. No, 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 what he said was, we're the winners, so prima facie we should get all our costs. Then he goes on and asks, are there other factors I need to take? Because he calls that, that um, hard or soft, uh, soft conclusion. Are, are there other factors he needs to take into account? And there are the other factors that were put before him by mm -hmm. the parties. And he goes through all those factors, mm -hmm. and he doesn't find any of those sufficiently compelling to change his initial view, which is that winners get all their costs. Right. And, and we say that is something which may be surprising, may not be what um, my lord would have done in those circumstances, but it doesn't uh, demonstrate an error principle, nor does it um, uh, evidence him exercising discretion in a perverse way. Well, the next like assist you further, there's our submissions. No, I don't think any more, so thank you very much, Mr. Van Heer. Uh, Mr. Lichidopoulos. Thank you, my lord. Well, my lords, I'll take the in the uh, order uh, right that my learned friend wants, so I'll start with the exclusive license uh, points, if that's convenient. Um, I think I can take this relatively quickly. Um, just before we start, Mr. my Lord, Lord Justice first asked a question about the value uh, of, that we're arguing about at the market, and, and just, uh, I've been instructed, this, I think it's in the evidence, it's about £30 million pounds a year uh, for circadian, and, and uh, that's what the party has. About. In relation to my, my own friend, took you to the, uh, the patent, and he took you to the marketing authorization, and he took you to the license, and uh, he made the submission of whether there was clear demarcation. And we say actually, it's very clear there is clear demarcation. And indeed, he took my lords to the definition of a generic in the uh, directive, uh, and there's no dispute that it's uh, clear uh, what a generic equivalent of circadian is, and it's in the same pharmaceutical form as a bioequivalent. Everyone in this industry knows uh, what a generic equivalent is, and it's not a situation where before my lords there's some sort of unknown uh, uh, grant. It's very clear what's been grant, I'm a granted, and my learned friend has to accept it's an exclusive grant on the face of the uh, agreement. In relation to the points on the appeal, uh, he maintains that uh, it's nonetheless uh, uh, not uh, or rendered non-exclusive in, in terms of the uh, statute uh, because of the operation of uh, Section 67. And in our submission, we have to be very careful that the agreement and the result of the agreement did not and was not held to remove all rights of Flynn to obtain a relief or to remove all flights rights of Flynn to bring proceedings. The judge held it removed the right independently of Neuro. And that's an important distinction. Uh, and uh, the, the agreement, we can go to it, but I think we've been to it uh, enough, but in section clause 17, it actually has in 17.1 provision that both parties must tell the other and required to tell the other if evidence of infringements and then, as my Lord Lord Justice Arnold pointed out, uh, I had a uh, submission to my early friend, 17.2 then has Neurim shall take uh, infringement proceedings. And the combination of those, we say, means it's not, a, it's not an agreement whereby somehow uh, the rights of Flynn to obtain relief have been removed. Uh, it can still uh, obtain damages for its own loss. That's a very important right. And that's actually why we're, we're here. Uh, and so we say, or well, mustn't take the finding of the judge, which we accept, too far. It does not remove all uh, of the rights. Uh, and uh, section uh, 67.2 is clear uh, that one obtains uh, 
that, that what the purpose of the section was to allow exclusive licensees to obtain uh, remedy uh, for encroachments on their ex exclusivity, and Flynn has that. My Lord, as regards um, uh, uh, salami slicing, uh, there was a discussion about the meaning of context otherwise requires in section 130. I, I think my, my learned friends, my learned friend in the end, uh, his submission was that the context did not otherwise require, but had to be read with the additional requirement as he sees it of section 67.1. So uh, in the end, uh, we say, well, that actually is saying that the definition of section 130 is as it is in 130, any right. And in relation to section 67.1, my learned friends suggested, or agreed with my Lord and Justice Burse, that my learned friends' case is that one must read section 67.1 as meaning that the exclusive licensee must have his right to bring proceedings. Uh, but of course, that can't possibly mean uh, by independently of the patentee. And that doesn't make sense of section 67.3, which says the patentee must be joined as either a claimant or a defendant. So it's, it's wrong to read in uh, must have, as my friend seeks to do. As regards the Swan report, um, it, it is, uh, we say, uh, of note uh, that it always refers to enabling an exclusive licensee to sue and obtain relief. Uh, we say the word uh, enabling is important. And it also, uh, again, as we say, there's nowhere there any suggestion about being able to bring proceedings independently of the patentee or in the sense that my own friend is seeking. And, of course, uh, it, it is worth just briefly, uh, if one looks at, uh, my learned friend went to a section of this that I had not gone to, and so that's JA32. Page 420, uh, I've taken my lords to 100, paragraph 134, and you have my submissions on that. Um, my, my little friend went to paragraph 132 uh, and uh, point, uh, talk, saw there that uh, one of the purposes was uh, a guarantee against competition uh, and also at the last sentence uh, uh, entitled to demand protection against the illegitimate com competition of infringers. And we say Flynn has that, uh, and it can has the right to demand protection, uh, and uh, the, uh, the agreement is that then uh, proceedings will be uh, pursued uh, together. As regards salami slicing, I don't have uh, anything really to uh, 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 add, so I'm subject to I should make some submissions on produce. Um, in, rela in relation to the salami slicing, as it's put, this is the phrase that was used by uh, Mr. Watson use Queen's Council in Purdue, so that's where the salami slicing phrase uh, comes from, I believe. Um, but uh, we say one has to keep one's mind uh, fully focused on the statutory language, any right in respect of the invention. Uh, and uh, that is where we say, uh, my little friend is constantly trying to limit that. In relation to uh, Purdue, uh, just to have a look at uh, one point on that, uh, which is in tab 18 of um, joint authorities. Uh, uh, we say, and I'm sure my, my lords have this point, and I, I think it was mentioned by my lord or Justice Arnold as well, but of course this is not, Mr Justice Robert Walker, as he then was, was, was not considering this issue other than for the sake of the cyanamid test at an interim injunction stage. A and he held the point of it. So uh, we say one has to be very careful before one takes what Mr Justice uh, Robert Walker, with great respect to him, was saying here, because his purpose wasn't to determine the issue. His purpose was to see if there was a serious question to be tried in order then to go on and consider arguments of quantifiable harm and irreparable harm uh, and balance of justice and the like. And he did say uh, in the passage that my then friend uh, took you to, uh, which is... Uh, on uh, page 234, no, sorry, that's wrong, 235, 
although he saw some force in Mr. Watson's submissions uh, about salami slicing rights under different claims, on the facts of this case, uh, uh, that's where he saw some force. In the end, he thought it was arguable. Of course, one has to be careful here uh, as to, at this stage, he didn't need to go into any more detail, but the facts of this case was, it was to terms with nappies, uh, and claim two uh, had a single landing strip where you could put to, to tie the uh, nappy together, uh, and claim one covered single and uh, multiple. And the issue had been whether, in fact, uh, a, a license had been given to Procter & Gamble, which encroached on that. And it, it wasn't entirely clear, once he's in the judgment, the position. It didn't matter for the purposes of the interim injunction in the end. But one sees that at paragraph 230, sorry, page 231 uh, at the bottom, because Procter & Gamble had obtained immunity from suit, uh, including the United Kingdom, for disposable nappies incorporating a split DFS, as it was called, which was a kind of dedicated fastening strip. But not, I must emphasise, a single DFS. There was a much more limited grant of immunity from suit in respect of a single DFS, and then the genesis of the split one was not fully explained, and it was about a centimetre wide. So on the facts, it wasn't entirely clear as to the position, but it was uh, the judge was uh, sufficiently happy to proceed on the basis that it was arguable, and then the case was then considered on silent grounds. Uh, and so we say uh, certainly the judge was not holding, or there's not authority uh, for the sort of issues that are before my laws today, and nor was it gone into any sort of uh, depth. Um, my lord, that was all I was going to say on the uh, exclusive license part of the appeal. On, on costs, uh, my, my learned friend uh, referred to a number of the authorities uh, about costs appeals, and as I said at the beginning yesterday, we understand those and accept those. He, he took you today to uh, uh, Roche, I think it was Lord Justice Stuart Smith, uh, about uh, you must be uh, satisfied that the judge left something out of account uh, or did not uh, factor in the uh, properly balancing in the scale, uh, and we say that is what's happened in that the uh, UK proceedings and judgment have not uh, properly been factored in, uh, and uh, you have my uh, submissions on ground two of our appeal. On ground one of our appeal, uh, we say that uh, all the time what did not properly happen here was factoring in what actually happened in the English proceedings, and everything went to the, uh, in the end, about the EPO uh, proceedings. Uh, and uh, my, my learned friend uh, pointed uh, to the judgment uh, as regards who was at fault. And we say plainly the judge was operating on the basis that neither party was at fault for what happened in the EPO. Uh, uh, and in one sense, blamed both, if I put it that way, when I say neither well, at fault. It's not a question of who was at fault for what happened in the EPO. No, no uh, sorry, it's no. the interaction. I, I said that wrongly. Well, Specific mistake. He he was he took the view that both parties were at fault yes. in allowing a situation to arise where an expedited trial in this jurisdiction went ahead, even though there had been an expedition of the Board of Appeal here. But my my lord is absolutely correct. Um, I've misspoke. Um, and so, uh, but it's in that we say it's important. Both parties are at fault. Uh, and uh, I pointed out in opening that uh, the uh, judge actually went out of his way, actually, to say that had the opera system, had it been reversed, <laughs> he would do the same thing uh, to, uh, the other way around. And he said, I am not, he went out of his way to say he wasn't blaming uh, Neurin, but we say that is actually uh, the effect uh, of what has happened, even if the judge uh, did not uh, appreciate it. My other friend um, made a point uh, about compensation and that we, at the interim injunction, it was held that we uh, uh, would not suffer irreparable harm. Um, for my Lord's note, I mean, it was, it's clearest, you can see it clearest from the uh, Court of Appeal judgment that it was uh, very much related to the expedited trial that had by then been ordered in the UK. So to put it in a nutshell, what this court held was that there were the damages that would be suffered by the claimants over period to trial was adequately compensatable by damage. That's right. And the trial at that stage had, uh, as it said in the court,
Court of Appeal judgment at 35 to 40, and the trial at that stage had been set in October. Sure. And also the Court of Appeal pointed out, as my lord may remember, um, that uh, actually some of the evidence, uh, my clients actually, was assuming a, 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 a longer period to trial. Uh, the important point I would say now, from what my learned friend said, is at this time of the interim injunction application, the EPO had not set a date for the technical board of appeal. So it wasn't that we knew at that stage. Well, coincidentally, it was the same date that the judge handed down his judgment refusing the interim injunction. But it was coincidentally. <laughs> Absolutely right. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, forgive me. Coincidentally, what? Oh, yeah, they, uh, they uh, handed. They said what the date would be for the hearing of the. Technical oh, I see. Board the EPO appeal. said the date yes. for the for the TBA hearing yes. at the same third of June. Right. First was both when the exposition yes. of the TBA yes. hearing was, it was ordered, and when the judge handed down his judgment, yes. saying no to the interview. Is that all right, my lord? No, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, Uh, in relation to uh, then uh, uh, other factors, um, uh, my lords, we say in a nutshell really that, that it must uh, a factor that must be uh, factored in is what happened uh, actually in the English uh, proceedings and the judgment, and that takes me then to the issue-based approach. And my lords uh, have heard my learned friend's response to uh, the quest or discussion with the bench about the judgment at paragraph eighty. Um, I mean, we say the judge did in paragraph 80 reject an issues based approach, but we say that is not fairly within the discretion, uh, our exercising the discretion fairly. Uh, the reasons he rejected an issue based approach were effectively uh, because of the EPO result. Uh, and uh, that actually leads them to do better by losing in the UK than if they'd won in the UK. Uh, and we say that isn't. Uh, by any, on any stretch of the <coughs> within the even broader uh, of a discretion uh, of the judge in the first instance has. And we say actually that plainly an issue based approach is uh, the right approach. My own friends pointed out that in our skeleton we said a cost shape could be produced, and of course it has been now, and we uh, accept the uh, amounts there. <laughs> you have a used one. You're relying on the one that was produced below by the other side. <laughs> It's a fair uh, point. point. <laughs> <laughs> well, levity before we start on the short term. I shouldn't do it. Sorry, my lord. Uh, um, uh, of course, uh, but we... My lord's right. Um, but uh, we say that what's on there, uh, one sees the amounts for obviousness, and we say the common general knowledge. I've shown you the uh, judgment on both of those and the criticisms of their expert, uh, and also the amount that was actually on their case spent on the insufficiency arguments as a whole, let alone the one. Uh, and so we say uh, this uh, uh, isn't a, uh, if my lords are, uh, are against me on the other points on costs, it plainly is the approach of an issue based approach. And there is no proper, we say, proper reason to ignore that, to simply examine their costs rather than others. My lords, we're now five to one, and unless I can. Well, there is one point that you haven't addressed, oh, sorry, which is. Uh, we have canvassed with, to use to some extent, but certainly with Mr. Van Hegan, an alternative possibility, which is no order as to costs, which is something that the judge appears to have contemplated at paragraph 81, uh, although he then rejects it. Um, and when asked about that, Mr. Van Hegan's first answer was to say, well, nobody asked for it. Well, uh, whether or not nobody asks for it is the right approach. But certainly, my lord, um, we say that better reflects the uh, position of, than the judge's order, because it does at least take account of both what happened at the EPO and what happened at the UK. We say it does not reflect it as well as an issue-based order. So uh, that, that would be our position. So you accept that factually speaking, it's correct that nobody asked for it. And that was my understanding, and I'm not around. Mm -hmm. But as I understand it, your submission is that even though nobody formally made that request before the judge, the judge was alive to the possibility, and therefore it was something that would have been within his discretion to order, 
And if we take the view that he erred in principle in making the order that he did make, that's one possibility that's open to this court. We do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in which case, um, we'll leave the case there for today. Um, thank you all very much for your submissions. Um, uh, as you would expect, judgment will be reserved. Um, in accordance with what is what has become the norm, uh, I would expect the judgments to be handed down uh, remotely. Um, even if that were not the case, there would of course be no need for anyone to be in the courtroom for the hand down. Um, in the normal way, you will uh, receive the judgments uh, in draft for you to correct our typing and English, but not to re-argue the case. Uh, uh, and again, in the normal way, we'd be grateful if you would seek to agree an order dealing with consequential matters. If there are points on which you can't agree, we would be grateful for brief written submissions, and we would expect to settle the points in the order that we make. Um, but uh, thank you all very much.